All right, guys. Going live in. This meeting is being recorded. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome and thank you for joining today's Freedom of Information Act Advisory Committee meeting. Before we begin, please ensure that you have opened the WebEx participant and chat panels by using the associated icons located at the bottom of the screen. Please note all audio connections are muted and this conference is being recorded. You are welcome to submit written questions throughout the meeting, which will be addressed at the Q&A session of the meeting. To submit a written question, select all panelists from the drop-down menu in the chat panel, then enter your question in the message box provided and sent. To ask a question via WebEx Audio, please click the raise hand icon on your WebEx screen, which is located above the chat panel on the right. This will place you in the question queue. If you are connected to today's meeting via regular phone audio, please dial pound two on your telephone keypad to enter the question queue. If you require technical assistance, please send a chat to the event producer. With that, I'll turn the meeting over to Alina Simo. Alina, please go ahead. Thank you, Michelle. Um, good morning, everyone. As the Director of the Office of Government Information Services, OGIS, and this committee's chairperson, it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to our seventh meeting of the fourth term of the FOIA Advisory Committee. I hope everyone who is joining us today has been staying safe, healthy, and well. I want to welcome all of our committee members today and express my gratitude for your continued commitment to studying the FOIA landscape in order to develop recommendations for improving the FOIA process government-wide. I know you have put a lot of work in already and we're now in the home stretch. I also want to welcome our colleagues and friends from the FOIA community and elsewhere who are watching us today, either via WebEx or with a slight delay on NARA's YouTube channel. Normally at this point in the meeting, you would be hearing welcoming remarks from the Archivist of the United States, David Ferriero. Um, I am very sad to report that today's David's last meeting with us um, as Archivist as he gets ready to retire at the end of this month. So we decided to engage him in a brief question and answer session um, and he can share his wisdom with us. Um, so with David's indulgence, um, can we get started? David, you're on mute. Oh, um, good. Okay. Ready. Ready. All right. So first question, I'm just going to fire them away like a interrogation squad. What are your proudest achievements as the archivist of the United States for the last 12 and a half years? Well, just uh, for some context, I, um, I came to Washington from the New York Public Library where I was director of libraries and, and in retrospect was a pretty cushy job. And I was lured here by the promise of the Obama administration that the National Archives had an important role to play in his open government initiative. And that really resonated with me. And so I think I would point to the presidential memorandum in 2011, which tied good records management to, um, to open government. In fact, his message says the backbone of open government is good records management. And then that allowed me to d deliver a directive to the agencies with OMB, setting out a, a set of promises and a set of um, tasks for the executive branch agencies. It um, did a number of things. One of the things I'm proudest of is that it, it uh, established the senior agency official responsible for records management. So it raised the profile of records management within the agencies, or it was supposed to. And it, and it cha um, charged OM, OPM with coming up with the classification series, the occupational series of records manager. It horrified me in a public meeting to discover there was no such thing as a records manager in the occupational series. So I'm proudest of that. And it also, most importantly, it acknowledged electronic records. <laughs> It, it established the shift from paper to electronic records. It's the first time since the Truman administration that the White House has gotten involved in records management. So I'm really proud of that. And the second thing I would point to is 
that the work that was done by a task force um, on racism here in the National Archives during um, 2020 um, with a set of recommendations looking at internal processes in terms of uh, recruitment, retention, advancement opportunities, um, looking at our exhibits and uh, educational programs and, and a really important um, set of recommendations around uh, how we describe our records, offensive language in our records. There's some a very important work that's going on in, in that arena. So those are a couple of things. And then we established sleepovers for kids eight to 12 years old. So I would point to that as something really exciting. Yeah, I wish I would have had kids that age because I really wanted to um, wake up in the morning and have you cook pancakes. That would have been a real treat. So these kids sleep on the floor with an adult, with their with a parent or something, and sleep on the floor of the rotunda in the presence of the Charters of Freedom, and they're just tingling with excitement. That's great. Um, one of your many accomplishments during your over 12 years at the National Archives was to establish this FOIA advisory committee. Uh, why an advisory committee, and what makes this group special in the FOIA landscape? So this gives me an opportunity to thank you all for the work that you have been doing and for the past um, advisory committee members. Um, this is an important, one of the things that, that I inherited was OGIS and um, ensuring that OGIS was getting the level of support required to, to do their work. So this was an education um, opportunity for me also to learn about um, FOIA and recognize the importance to the American public of the work that all of you do every day to ensure that you have access to the records. The National Archives was established. Um, the Franklin Roosevelt signed the legislation that created the National Archives. And his, his goal in, in, stated, in stated when he um, opened the Presidential Library in Hyde Park was the, that these records are important for the American people to hold their, their government accountable for its actions and to learn from the past. And that has been my you know, watchword since I started here. And FOIA is one of those ways that the American people can hold their government accountable. So I've been a huge supporter, I think, of the work of OGIS and um, the advisory committee. And it also is important to me that, that in everything that we do at the National Archives, every service we provide, we we put the American public at the center of our planning and thinking. How easy is it? How difficult is it for the American people to get the information they need? And what can we do to break down those barriers? And the FOIA Advisory Committee is a wonderful example of how the American people have, has their voice heard um, in terms of how we organize our services. Uh, so everyone wants to know, uh, David, will there be a 2022 to 2024 term of the FOIA Advisory Committee, a fifth term? I heard there is, yes. <laughs> One of my last actions was to ensure that that happens. Um, I, I don't see an end to this. You know, I think there, there are enough issues and enough concerns, and I think that it sends a message to the American public that the, that this government is serious about access to information and, and their voice needs to be heard. This is an important way for their voice to be heard. What, what would you like to see the next term of the committee delve into? I'm really pleased with um, the you know, set of um, issues that have already been dealt with. Um, I'm really concerned about uh, I'm, I'm interested in and pleased to see the attention turned to Congress um, about um, access to the records of Congress. It's interesting, you know, I've been, uh, it's, I've had 16 hearings on the Hill for various subjects, and all of them are, you know, records related, and it's, it's kind of ironic that I sit there answering questions from people whose records aren't FOIAable. Um, that it doesn't seem like that's a, a fair way of, of doing business. So 
So the attention that the advisory committee has been paying to records of Congress, I think is important. We have seen, um, you have seen in the press lots recently about the um, presidential records and um, FOIA ability of presidential records. The Presidential Records Act, um, uh, I would say, is worthy of some look by the advisory committee. Um, it needs to be strengthened, and you have a role, I think, uh, to play in that process. Um, and and the FOIA law itself, you know, we've over time may amended that law. Um, I would I would uh, urge you to continue that process of, of looking at the law and figuring out ways that to make it stronger, better, and um, take a look at exemptions. I know that's on. I know that's on your list of priorities. What message? And, and one, I'm sorry. Go ahead, David. One more thing. Sure. Huge um, agenda of the National Archives has to do with civic education. Um, the folks, kids today, and their parents don't understand roles and responsibilities. They don't know how the government works. Um, all that kind of thing. It's an opportunity, also, I think, for education of the American public about FOIA and their rights around access to information. So figuring out ways of plugging into the civic education initiatives that are going on around the country. That's great. I, I wrote all those down. Good. Follow up. Uh, what message do you have for the more than 5,000 FOIA professionals across the government whose job it is to respond to FOIA requests every day? First of all, thank you for the work that you do. I'm sure you don't get many thanks for what you do. Um, I'm sure you get lots of criticism for what you do, but um, hear from the archivist how much I appreciate the work that you do every day against um, increasingly difficult odds. You know, the, for many of you, the information technology infrastructure uh, sucks, and, and um, there isn't uh, an, an acknowledgement you know, on the Hill or at you know OMB often about the technology needs and how this isn't a one-time event. It's a process that te technology needs to be refreshed. New tools um, are available um, that need to be incorporated into your repertoire of of information. And um, the the partnership that you have in your own agencies with the senior agency official, the IT folks, your, your legal counsel, even your, you know, inspector general. It's a, it's a, and a robust uh, relationship team of people focused on making sure that, that we're following the law and making records available. So um, I'm really proud of the work that you do every day. Um, so on uh, on the other side, what message uh, do you have for the many FOIA requesters who submit FOIA requests to the government every year? Over eight hundred thousand this past year. I know, I know. Um, I would um, urge you to be as specific as you can about what you're looking for. Um, I urge you to take some time to understand what the process is, learn the process, so that that you don't get caught in. Uh, unrealizable expectations. Um, use the services of OGIS. That's why OGIS was established to help you meet your your needs. And um, I would say, educate your legislators. As private citizens, you have an opportunity to talk to your legislators about FOIA and the needs um, that that exist or support of FOIA. Uh, David, what do you think you're going to miss most about uh, being the archivist of the United States? I think it's the opportunity to um, ensure that the records of the country are created and maintained and made available to the American public. Um, and, and that happens in a variety of ways you know, across the country. The staff of 2,700 people in 40 facilities focused on that mission. I think the, the opportunity to, 
to work with that staff and think about ways that we can make that more efficient, better, easier. Um, that's the exciting, that's the, how the excitement I have found on the job and I, I will miss that. So what's next for you after you retire? Um, are we going to see you joining us as an attendee at future FOIA advisory committee meetings? <laughs> No promises, but I will um, certainly be looking for ways that I can, from the outside, be supportive of the work. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not planning to run for office, but I will certainly, I'm not leaving this behind. I'm going to figure out ways that I can be helpful. All right. Well, thank you, David. Um, I'm just extremely grateful for um, everything you've done for us. Um, on behalf of the committee, uh, I want to thank you for all the support you've given us, uh, your willingness to advance so many of the recommendations that we've already sent over to you. Um, we will truly miss your leadership and your extraordinary support for improving the FOIA process. Uh, but we also know you're leaving us in excellent hands with the Deputy Archivist, um, Deb Wall. So we look forward to working with her as well. Um, okay, are you going to stick around for a little bit and watch the meeting if you are able i am for a little bit i know you have a packed schedule so appreciate any time you can give us thank you thank you um, all right thanks again so um i want to move on to some um, housekeeping rules and announcements before we get our substantive meeting started we do have a very busy agenda today um uh, so let me just get through the quick announcements. Unfortunately, our committee's designated federal officer, DFO, Kirsten Mitchell, is unable to join us today. Uh, the archivist has appointed Martha Murphy, um, OGIS's deputy director, as the alternate DFO. Martha is going to help make sure that uh, we stay on track today. Martha has taken a visual roll call. And Martha, we have a quorum, correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, I want to report Dion Stearns and A.J. Wagner are unable to join us today. Um, and James Stoker will need to drop out uh, for a brief time around noon for 15 to 20 minutes, but he promises to rejoin us. Okay, a um, few words about public comments. We are going to have a 15 minute public comment period at the end. We have received two sets of uh, written comments in advance of today's meeting, and we have posted those on our website. Um, we have also shared those comments with all committee members in advance of today's meeting. Uh, I want to note that the chat function in WebEx um, or the NARA YouTube channel is not the proper forum to submit extensive public comments, but you may submit public comments at any time by emailing us at FOIA-advisory-committee at NARA.gov, and we will consider posting them on the OGIS website. Uh, the chat function on both platforms should be used to ask clarifying questions or provide brief comments or questions that we will consider reading out loud at the end of today's meeting. During our public comments period, the committee is specifically interested in feedback on the issues that we are discussing today. Meeting materials for this term, along with members' names, affiliations, and biographies are available on the committee's webpage. Click on the link for the 2020 to 2022 FOIA Advisory Committee on the OGIS website. Uh, please also visit our website for today's agenda, PowerPoint presentation, and lots of related meeting materials. As I mentioned earlier, we have a very packed agenda today. We have numerous recommendations that subcommittees are eager to present and perhaps even finalize and have the committee vote on today. Um, as chairperson, I do reserve the right to adjust the agenda times as necessary. Uh, we will upload a transcript and video of this meeting as soon as they become available. Uh, a reminder to committee members, I have all of you up on screen, so I will try to watch your verbal cues. Uh, it's not the same as being in person um, and watching you. So if I miss you, please chat me or Martha to let us know that you want to ask a question or you want to make a comment. Um, so please use the all panelists option from the drop down menu. But um, also a reminder in order to comply with the FOIA, I'm sorry, the Federal Advisory Committee Act backup, um, please only keep your communications in the chat function to housekeeping and procedural matters. No substantive comments should be made in the chat function as they will not be recorded in the transcript of the meeting. It, uh, committee members, if you need to take a break at any time, please do not disconnect from either audio or video. Instead, mute your microphone 
turn off your camera and send us a quick chat, um, me and Martha, to let us know how long you'll be gone. Um, and join us uh, as soon as you can again. If all goes according to plan, the agenda right now has us breaking at 11.30 this morning. Uh, we may end up breaking a little earlier or a little later, depending on our pace. Uh, and just a reminder, I'm guilty of this myself, but uh, every time you speak, please try to identify yourself as um, by your name and your affiliation. It helps with the transcript down the road. Um, so we don't have any mini uh, minutes of uh, the last committee meeting to approve today. That was uh, March 10th. Unfortunately, I was unable to be with you, but Kirsten Mitchell did a fantastic job chairing that uh, meeting. Um, they are being worked on by our part-time detailee, Archivist Sean Heiliger from the National Archives at San Francisco. He's been preparing those minutes, and I hope they will be available to circulate for approval by the time we meet again next month. The transcript from the March 10th meeting uh, will also be posted on our website as soon as it becomes available, and you can view the meeting on the NARA YouTube channel. So um, I just wanted to go over the voting procedures today very quickly, um, because I do anticipate we're going to be having some votes today. Um, so without further ado, uh, any member of the committee can move to vote on any recommendation. The motion does not need to be seconded although it seems like we'd like to do that, so I'm, I'm happy to entertain them. The motion can pass by unanimous decision, which is when every voting member except abstentions uh, is in favor of or opposed to a particular motion. A general consensus, which is when at least two thirds of the total votes cast are in favor of or opposed to a particular motion. And a general majority, which is when a majority of the total votes cast are in favor of or are opposed to a particular motion. In the event of a tie, we will reopen discussion and the committee will continue to vote until there is a majority. So we may be here all night. Uh, just kidding. Votes will be by, by voice. All those in favor will say aye. Any opposed will say nay. Anyone who wishes to abstain will say abstain. And we'll pause a moment to give Martha a chance to make sure she's recorded the vote for each uh, recommendation. So any questions before we move on from the committee members? Okay, not seeing any. Uh, we're now going to turn over to the uh, discussion of the technology subcommittee. I know they went last last time and they had um, recommendations left over that they would like to present to the committee for discussion and vote. Um, uh, Michelle, may I please ask you to go to the next slide? Um, and I'm not stealing Jason and Allison's thunder. I just wanted to show that this is the first recommendation that the committee passed at the March 10th meeting. Um, and today we're going to be discussing the remaining recommendations. Um, so I'm going to now turn it over to Allison Dietrich and Jason Cart, our co-chairs. Thanks. Thanks so much, Alina. This is Allison Dietrich, Commerce Department. I'm gonna uh, go over Recommendation uh, two, and then Jason's going to handle three. So based on the uh, conversations we had at last month's meeting, we made some changes to this recommendation. One of the comments had been instead of a uh, working, having a working group executive branch based uh, to discuss the ways to deal with metadata at, or native file releases, um, there were some uh, some uh, suggestions to either have an advisory committee set up by the archivist or to have the chief FOIA officers council uh, have a working group. And we discussed this at our last meeting and decided that we wanted the chief FOIA officers council to establish a working group to deal with metadata issues. And we did as a bit of a compromise uh, encourage the technology committee of the chief FOIA officers council to work with outside experts, including the requester community. So that's the way we came up with that one. And just as a refresher, some of the uh, metadata fields that we think should be included or at least looked at are the identifier, file name, record ID, title, description, creator, creation date, and rights restrictions held on that particular file. Um, Michelle, may I please ask you to advance to the next slide? So 
the committee has in front of them the, um, there we go. Thank you. Okay, we're in business. Sorry, Allison. It's okay. Do we want to deal with or uh, discuss the first or rec TS2 first and then move to TS3? Might be easier. If this is James that. Stoker. Can I ask a question about uh, recommendation two? Sure. Okay. So um, I, I noticed that um, the committee is recommending these seven categories of, of metadata. And I guess what I wanted to know is how this differs from NARA Bulletin 2015-4, which I think requires the exact same seven categories of metadata. So basically, I guess my general question is, how does this recommendation differ from the NARA Bulletin, except that it advocates for a creation of a working group to discuss it? Um, I think it is the same seven fields. It is just because we feel that this is important, although not all requesters want metadata. Some that do are very interested in it. And we mm -hmm. see having the uh, Chief FOIA Officers Technology Committee take the next step as a way to continue this conversation and look at ways and technology um, such as uh, archiv the archivist referred to and just keep this discussion going forward. This is James again. Uh, well, th thanks, thanks very much. Uh, that clarifies that. Um, I just... I feel like it needs a what what we need is a better understanding of what issues remain to be resolved. If in twenty fifteen seven fields were recommended and we're sticking with the seven, same seven fields, is there someone complaining that you know certain data is not being released or or what is the the challenge this is trying to address? I think part of the challenge is the technological. Um, issue between the FOIAs saying if requesters are requesting in um, metadata that to the extent that an agency is able to provide it, they should, but a lot of agencies don't have that technological ability to release the metadata or especially in the intelligence community, there are issues and concerns with potentially releasing classified information or information otherwise subject to an exemption. So we were looking at this issue, we realized that although not everybody has that issue, especially um, historians and I'll let some of the other uh, requester community members from the technology subcommittee chime in as well, but trying to just realize that, that it's not an issue for everybody, but for those who it is an issue for, it's a big concern and something that they're very interested in. And I think some of the other comments from the last meeting were also not, in addition to metadata, if there are flattened PDFs, you don't necessarily get hyperlinks. You see an underline that says, file title X, but you don't know what file title X is or what the web address is to look at it yourself. So that was one of the other possibilities that had come up at the last meeting. I'll open that up to others who have comments on that. Yeah, this is a Jason, Jason Guard History Associates Incorporated. Um, you're absolutely right, James. Um, the, the, the metadata that we want released, the file elements we want released, do align with narrow bolts in 20. 1504, and the reason is because that actually that that actually was designed to make sure records that were accessioned into um, the National Archives um, maintained the metadata. Right now, that's not being released to the requester community. They don't know how to release it to the requester community, and we feel that you know this needs to be this needs to be flagged. And the research has already been done. I mean the the Bulletin 2015-04 goes back to the Dublin, Ohio workshop in 1995, where they essentially said, here's what should be preserved in electronic records. Um, you know, NARA is telling federal agencies, if you deposit materials in the National Archives as electronic material, these are the metadata elements that need to be preserved. So we're saying that, well, if you release that same information to the requester community, here's the metadata elements that should be preserved. With the caveat that, of course, you're going to be subject to the FOIA exemptions and that, you know, there's going to be classified national security records that may need um, potential protocols or special protocols. Um, so that that's that's where we see the issue is that um, it doesn't seem like it's been flagged. Right. And we feel it's going to be more important as we progress. And, you know, we have agencies releasing emails as PDFs, which, you know, is well weird, right? It's not in its native format. Uh, 
Hi, this is Kel. I have a question for sort of when you were doing the research into this. And I think we talked a little bit about this in the last meeting, but I, something you just said uh, piqued my interest. When you have a record that is transferred to the archives and accessioned that has metadata in it, and the archives makes it publicly available, is the metadata version, is the metadata in uh, the archives version that you can go and get through sort of whatever the archive system is uh, available to the public, or is it stripped out there too as a current practice? So my experience has been that records do include metadata. So on the, and the Archivist of the United States can correct me, but the AAD, which is essentially the set of electronic records that are accessible, they do have the metadata elements. In fact, some of the records I've seen go back to uh, punch cards, right, in the National Archives. And they even have, you can even figure out what the different fields in the punch cards are, which are essentially the metadata. So, um, and, and that's the point. The point is, is that the federal government is going to an all electronic records environment and that metadata is an important part of that. So when we release things through FOIA, we being, I'm not in the government, but you all, um, you make sure you include that metadata with the caveats that there's some pieces that you don't want released. And, and Kristen um, at FBI can talk about that because we, we had a lot of conversations about that and what it means that we don't want to release certain pieces of metadata. Um, and that's, you know, and that's where, you know, we, we also speak to that. This is Dave Coulier, University of Arizona. I move that we approve rec recommendation two. Oh, I have a second for that. I'll second. Thank you, Kel. All right. Well, let's okay, well let's take a voice vote. All those in favor of recommendation two, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say nay. Are there any nays? Any abstentions? Hi, this is Bobby from DOJ, and I abstain. I also am going to abstain, uh, given the fact that uh, Bobby and I are both co-chairs of the CFO Council, but uh, we're happy to follow up on this recommendation. Martha, did you get all of that? that yes, ma'am. I got it. We're good. Uh, all right, great. Should we move on to the next recommendation? Michelle, next slide, please. Great. So, Allison, just so you know, I'm responsible for this. I set it up in part one and part two because there were two parts to this recommendation. So, um, if you're unhappy, you can take it out on me. But anyway, go ahead. The floor is back to you. But Jason. Thank you. Uh, Jason Gard, History Associates Incorporated. So um, this, the third, this is the third recommendation now coming out of the committee. Um, and this relates to something that I think was said when we first began, which is, you know, what are the recommendations from the prior, um, from the prior um, committees that haven't been, haven't been pushed forward, that have just kind of um, languished out there, uh, languished out there. And so, um, there's two that we find very important, and the first um, deals with 508 compl uh, with um, with um, 508 compliance, and we we believe that um, the 508 Compliance and Collaborative Tools Working Group at the Te Technology Committee of the Chief FOIA Officers Council continued to research ways to assist agencies in making this um, requirement. We see the um, the opportunity with um, the changing of um, FOIA platforms as an opportunity for us, for that group to make recommendations or business requirements um, that could help um, FOIA processing vendors ensure that 508 compliance technology is incorporated into software solutions. So, um, you know, the big thing for this and the thing that I think the committee brings to this is that we believe that within two year period following the release of this report, 
um, we want this to be implemented. So we, we want this to have a, a expiration date, so to speak. And Allison, you're going to do that? Oh, oh, good. I was just going to pass it on to Allison. Go ahead. All right. Sorry, this is Bob from DSA. And it's actually not a substantive, but just a wording. I want to flag. I feel like we shouldn't say that there's a conflict between the proactive disclosure provisions and Section 508. They both deal with important accessibility issues. Um, it's just that, you know, 508 is dealing with accessibility for a specific community. There's challenges, obviously, but I, I don't think there is an inherent conflict, and they're both equally important. So I just don't like that language of there being a conflict between the two provisions. Can we, Bobby, can we change it to inherent challenges instead of yeah. conflicts? Yeah, I think that works better. It's just I don't see a conflict between the two provisions. Jason and Allison, is that acceptable to you? I'm fine with that. Yeah, um, I I ask AJ, Christian, David, Roger. I'm fine with that. Ms. Roger, I'm fine with that. Okay. Do you want to, Jason? Do you want to move to have this part one recommendation approved with that change, substitute so, for a challenge for conflicts? Yes, correct. Um, uh, uh, so moved. Do I have a second? I second, Ms. Roger. Thank you, Roger. Um, okay, let's take a voice vote. All those in favor of the recommendation as it currently reads with the word conflict substituted uh, with the word challenges, uh, please say aye. 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 Anyone uh, opposed to this, please say nay. Okay, any abstentions? Hi, this is uh, Bobby from DOJ and I abstain. Okay, and this is Alina Simo. So I believe that recommendation has passed. Martha, are you good with gathering everyone's votes? Yep, all good, okay. thank you. Great. Uh, Michelle, next slide, please. Allison, are you going to do this one? You can do it or I can do it. It's up to you. No, that's fine. Um, so this one is um, relates to commercial portals. Um, we recommend that FOIA.gov as well as other commercial portals allow for the full text searching of FOIA logs. Um, additionally, we want agencies to proactively publish FOIA logs in the agency's electronic reading rooms often referred to as FOIA library, libraries on an ongoing basis and at least quarterly, um, unless the agency re receives 50 or less requests per year. Um, and then we provide some um, elements of, or fields that we believe would be most useful in those FOIA logs, the date of request, uh, the status of request fee category, things of that sort. Again, this is not something we came up with. This is something that um, the prior FOIA advisory committee um, had um, recommended. It has not really, um, um, it, it again, it has languished, and we believe that within two years following the release of the report that, that this gets um, actioned. This is James Stoker. Uh, so I have a question about the, um, I guess, the last part of this uh, recommendation where, you, where it says, um, unless the agency receives 50 or, or less requests per year, in which case annually or semi-annually would be appropriate. I wonder if that doesn't just complicate um, the recommendation unnecessarily. I, 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 I don't know. This doesn't seem like a particularly onerous requirement, and I could be underestimating the amount of work that goes into this. So maybe it would be better to, to have it just stop it quarterly uh, and require all agencies to do this. Is, is that a possibility or w would there be some objection to that? I think the fifth, that uh, limitation was done to be consistent with other guidance. I think the OI, or, um, OIP's guidance on websites. So we were just trying to do it for consistency, but I don't have a preference one way or the other. Do other members of the technology subcommittee or the committee as a whole have any thoughts on that? 
This is Kristen. This is, oh, sorry. This is Kristen no. from the FBI. I, I don't necessarily have a problem with keeping it in or taking it out. It just strikes me that it could be unnecessary work if an agency receives in a quarter one request. I mean, yes, they could put it up as a log, but it just strikes me that publishing either annually or semi-annually when you're talking about only a handful of requests is more efficient than, you know, publishing in a quarter that we didn't receive any FOIA requests this month or we got one and here's the log. I don't know that it's onerous. I just don't know that um, it necessarily benefits anyone really to post that on a quarterly basis. This is, Kel, I, I have a bit of a, it's not a nitpick, it's a question. So what's on the screen as the draft recommendation is not what's in the document as the recommendation. And so if we vote on this recommendation, are we voting on the document that's on the website as the PDF, or are we voting on what's on the screen? Because at least on this one, they are, uh, this is agency should proactively publish FOIA logs, whereas this one, um, it's 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 not exactly clear that this is recommending that they be required to have FOIA logs, and so like, and I'll use as one example, CIA does not maintain a FOIA log that you have to FOIA it periodically and they basically create it from scratch periodically uh, that's not, it's not automatic and it's not um, anything like that. And so I, I wonder if this is something that we should put in. Was the intention, I guess my question is, was the intention of this recommendation to be a best practice for agencies to do it or to be a recommendation that agencies have to do it because that's a that's a distinction for some agencies my interpretation at least my thought was the recommendation for best practice especially if the technology lets individuals create their own logs then it's like the agency doesn't necessarily have to also proactively release it but i think it was more of a best practice than a requirement is there a reason that you did not go for, we recommend that the OIP direct this happen or that the statute be modified for this to happen? And you just went with, we, enc we encourage agencies to do this, which would really only reach the agencies that were already making FOIA logs. So this is from the DOJ. Do you, I mean, when this, this is recycling or just bringing back up a prior recommendation, was it a best practice then? Yeah, this is this is Jason Gart, History Associates. It was a best practice then. It's designed for consistency, so that um, they could contain minimum sets of data in Excel CSV files. In preference to PDF, which was which was seen as very annoying to the requester community, um, um, and I think it's uh, at least the way we discussed it among the group. And again, um, David, AJ, jump in, um, Kristen, was that you know this is uh, let's get them consistent. Let's allow for full text searching and its best practices. And if you're at an agency that again only has you know one request every month let's have a, a baseline level so you don't have to you just release it on an annual or semi-annual basis so kind of that's i guess was the background and what was kind of percolating in our in our minds is the um and excuse me if i because i just don't recall the uh, i do recall this conversation as part of prior backer committee but i don't have it the detail, you know, I don't, I don't recall it exactly. Uh, is the recommendation regarding FOIA.gov and the searchability, is that new or is that from the prior recommendation? Uh, 
I believe that's from the prior recommendation, Allison. I'm just trying to pull up the old recommendations. Give me one minute. Oh. While you're doing that, Allison, this is Dave Coulier uh, from the University of Arizona. Um, yeah, I, I, I think the there's a spectrum here. I mean, there are some of us who believe that federal agencies should be required to post their logs in a searchable way, I mean, almost immediately, as, as you see in some cities, counties, and other jurisdictions around the country. So there's some of us that that's what we would want in this recommendation. But, um, but you know, I think, you know, that's not going to be easy for everyone to swallow. And, and, and some agencies, you know, are saying, we don't have the money for the tech and that sort of thing. It's going to take time to work out. So I think this is an acknowledgement of that. And really intended to keep the conversation going. Um, it was brought up previously. I, I think what we're getting at here is we want this, this This is a priority for a lot of the requesters out there that, that we really move to a system across the federal government where anyone can easily see what's being requested and the disposition of those requests. Um, so I, I think that's kind of the intent here. Um. This is uh, Patricia Weth from EPA. Um, I think it, um, everything could be accomplished by maybe just slightly doing some wordsmithing on the recommendation. Um, maybe um, the recommendation, using your language, it could be we recommend that agencies proactively publish um, FOIA logs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then you could include and allow for full search, uh, full text searching of FOIA logs. So, so you're you're recommending um, the agencies to proactively publish, and 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 you know if they have the technology available, allow for that full text searching of those FOIA logs. I mean, it's just a thought. This is, oh, go ahead. Mahan from Villanova Law. Uh, I just wanted to, on James Stoker's earlier point, uh, suggest that um, maybe we strike all the language starting with the word uh, unless, the de minimis rule, uh, for the reason that it would be easier to determine than uh, what is going on with agencies, whether they actually are receiving 50 or less requests or they're just refusing to uh, sort of follow the recommendation, um, and uh, you know, I know that uh, places uh, a certain burden on agencies that receive fewer requests. Uh, but uh, at least it would be uh, somewhat more clear than that. Uh, sort of non, if we wouldn't mistake, uh, in other words, uh, non-compliance with uh, sort of low volumes of requests. Uh, Jason, what would you like to do? Do you want to try to take these comments in and rewrite the recommendation and represent at next month's meeting for a vote? I, I know you've gotten some lots of different feedback. Uh, also, I just wanted to address Kel's comment from earlier. The slide actually reflects exactly what's in the white paper, same language. So I was a little confused when you noted that there was a difference. There isn't. Um, but back to Allison and Jason, what would you like to do? So, um, Allison, David, AJ, um, or AJ is not here, Roger, Kurt, 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 um, I, you know, I, I would say that this is a recommendation, um, at least the base of it is a recommendation that's already been passed. You know, it's something that's been out there. It's something that hasn't, there hasn't been much movement on it and our intent was to try to get it back in front of everyone's attention and at a, an expiration date i think i'd be happy of going back and, and tweaking the language um i would also maybe suggest that we 
it, if it's okay with the committee, maybe we we approve it with the with the caveat that we'll tweak it further, but at least let's keep it. You know, let's move forward. Um, but again, I, Allison, Roger, David, I'm not sure, Christian, what what your thoughts are. This is Roger, Jason. I agree with you. Um, I think, I, I think that at least I don't hear any um, dispute that this is necessary. So what we are, what we're talking about here is just wordsmithing. So I don't think we should table this and bring it back. The vote, I think, just vote on it with the, with the understanding that we will tweak the language. I also had a question. I also had a question. Um, uh, maybe Bobby can can answer this because I'm just looking at it right now. I'm not sure that FOIA.gov has access to other FOIA logs of agencies. And so if it doesn't, um, probably this might be a, a the FOIA.gov might be a site, a location where one, one shop, you know, stop, you come there and you have access to all the FOIA logs posted by every agency. So you don't have to go to CDC site or DOJ site or EPA site, you can just come to FOIA.gov and you can find FOIA request that have been submitted to an agency and you might find the same FOIA request submitted to multiple agencies. This is sorry. Bobby from uh, DOJ. I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry, Bobby. I was just going to say I found the recommendations from the 2016-2018 term on the FOIA logs and back then they were presented as best practices. Um, and it just was to publish logs, ideally at least monthly, ongoing at least monthly, unless the agency receives fewer than 100 requests per year, in which case annually or semi-annually, then it uh, listed um, a list of uh, different uh, information to include, like fee waivers and exemptions, and then also encouraging that the log should be posted in Excel or CSV and not in PDF. So our recommendation was trying to take that a bit further in terms of getting the logs text searchable and if they can be extracted. So that's a bit of the difference. And then also we lowered it from 100 to 50 uh, requests or less per year as compared to the 100 that was in the original recommendation. So if that provides some background on other comments or thoughts about how to proceed. So this, this is Kevin, if that's the case and you know, this is the the changes to the original to the previous recommendation seem to be uh, relative, relatively minor. I I don't I don't agree with Roger that we should vote on whether or not this is necessary because I think that this is not uh, not sufficient. That if we're going to make another recommendation, I think it should go above what the previous recommendation was. And so I think that, you know, the previous recommendation was out there and agencies either followed it or they didn't. And I think that if we're going to make this recommendation, we should say, okay, now we're going to step it up and say, we recommend that for you.gov, the first line is the same. And then say, additionally, agencies should be required to proactively publish FOIA logs because clearly anyone who was going to do this uh, as a best practice would have already done it as a best practice. And so, and if, if they had done that, we wouldn't be here revisiting it. So I think we should sort of take the next step for that. And that's not just wordsmithing, that's actually changing the meaning of the recommendation. This is Bobby uh, from DOJ. So um, I, uh, and Alex, I appreciate that. Thanks, Kel. Um, hearing back what the recommendations was were really helpful. Um, we have been encouraging agencies to uh, post FOIA logs. I think FOIA logs are an important way to um, inform the public of what types of records agencies have, especially if we're not able to post as much records in our FOIA libraries as we'd like. Um, they do provide a level of resources. And so my view on this is that we shouldn't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And so I've encouraged agencies to post the logs in the ways they can that would provide the information most efficiently and effectively. So I, I would say that regardless of, you know, building on the prior recommendation or going back to the prior recommendation, um, the level of flexibility we provide agencies, I think, provides a better return. 
Um, and then also as with regard to FOIA.gov, um, being able to search across FOIA logs, we are currently looking at a number of ways to improve FOIA.gov. We uh, recently put an RFI out um, to see um, if we can get, uh, for example, a, a guided search, a guided feature on FOIA.gov um, where it might pull from maybe FOIA logs or what's posted in libraries or agency, you know, we don't know yet. So it's very, I guess my point is, it's very early in the stages and I'm not sure what te is technically feasible, particularly with uh, how things are posted in, right now, you know, in, in, differently and so forth, but certainly something that we can consider the feasibility of, um, seeing the value of it, um, but, you know, not something that today we could promise. And I, I think we're actually on the same page here. I, I, I do not see my recommendation or my tweak as reducing flexibility because it doesn't, the only change would be that they should be required to publish FOIA logs in some format that the, the, the thing, the seven items or whatever, the, however many items were in here, A through J are still a best practice for what should go into it. It's still, they still have the discretion to choose what best conveys the information. The only thing that they wouldn't have the discretion to do is just not do it. And so I think we can all agree that them not doing it is not conveying it in the way best suited for the, the conveyance of information. And I think um, that makes sense on a large scale. And it, uh, as, as long as we're recognizing that the agency should have a level of flexibility um, there as far as what a FOIA law is, I think that's really helpful. Um, and I will, I will say that, that, you know, we do have agencies, the fifth year less, we have agencies that you can say are 10 or less. And so it probably doesn't make any sense for them. And their FOIA logs, you know, might not be very helpful. But I think that's kind of small potatoes. So I, I'm not really, not something I would, um, uh, I can't remember saying, but I, I would, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's one way or the other. Um, Alan, I just saw a chat from you that you had a question. Uh, yes, picking up on, thank you, Elaine. This is Alan Blutstein from America Rising, picking up on where Bobby left off. I don't think we all need to necessarily agree on the, the 10 or so fields that should be in a FOIA log, but I was curious whether um, the disposition of the request was intentionally left off or whether it's covered in item G. In other words, if an agency found no records or withheld records or some other disposition, I think that would be useful. But I didn't see it in this list and I was wondering about it. Alan, I think one of the reasons we took that off the list was if a request had come in during the time frame but was not decided during that time frame, it wouldn't have a disposition result. I would respectfully say that that it should, should still be a field, but it should be a if closed disposition. You know that way. You know if it's if it's pen, it's it would be pending or closed. No records closed, exempt, closed, released uh, for release, partial release, whatever. But if you know it's, it's pending, that field would be in a. All right, um, not hearing anyone jumping up to make any more comments. I'm taking this back to Jason and Allison. How do you want to proceed? Actually, Alina, this is Linda from SSA. I have a yeah. quick, quick question. Sure. Um, I don't know, maybe I'm just misreading this, but under the FOIA Improvement Act, we're already required to post the raw data. Now, we always, treated that raw data as our FOIA log. Are FOIA logs actually considered something separate from that? Because if they're the same item, they're already required to be put out there. So I don't know, you know, I'm, I'm just, I guess I'm coming back on, do we really need this or is it already actually out there? This is Bobby from DOJ. There, there is a slight difference between the raw data 
and um, what we would consider a FOIA log. I guess the big part, I think, was um, of most public interest is probably the subject of the request. That's not captured in the annual report, so it's not in the raw data. Um, so a FOIA log would show uh, the requester the types of topics that are being requested, and potentially if you know they've been already released. So uh, the benefit would be the requester could either maybe you know if they're asking for records that have already been processed, so that's 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 easier. That's an easy one for the for the agency. We like those types of requests, um, or maybe just to better inform them of the types of records that the agency have. So that that's the big difference between, as I see it, between a call log, I mean, call log, a FOIA log, and um, our the, the incredible data that we do get from the raw data from the Airport report. Yeah, this is a uh, Jason Guard History Associates. That's absolutely correct. The requester community. Before we submit FOIA requests, we will search FOIA logs to see what's been released. So thus, you do not have to go through the FOIA process. It helps keep things out of, it helps not having to go through FOIA. You can see what's released and you can ask the, the office to, to, you know, release that to you. So that, and, and that's a huge value and, you know, a lot, lot, a lot of the requester community um, uses that and relies on that. And th this is Kel. I can add an, another added value to this, which is uh, I'll go to the FOIA logs or I'll have a, a client go to the FOIA logs and see, you know, if someone requested it and there was no records. You know, if, if someone else has filed a request for these records and it came back in no records response, sometimes we don't file a request for it because it's going to, unless we have a reason to doubt the the search and so that's a win-win for everybody because that means the agency doesn't have to process that request for something that they already said they don't have any records for which they would still have to conduct a search for they can't just say oh we said you know last year that we didn't have any records so we're going to say no records now they have to still search for it that adds to their backlog so releasing FOIA logs is good for the agency in some ways Thank you all for the clarification. I, I appreciate it because now it, it, the recommendation definitely makes more sense to me now. All right. So I'm really That's mindful right. of the time because uh, I, I know we have a packed agenda today. So looking back to Jason and Allison, what would you like to do? Do you want to move to approve this in the spirit and wordsmith it and represent it next month? Do you want to hold off until next month? What are what uh, path do you choose? What uh, adventure would you like to choose? So I'll, I'll just jump in, Allison. You can correct me, but let's move to approve and within the spirit. And Allison or David, Roger, you can say no, Christian. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I'm fine with that. And Allison, I'm sorry. Um, I'll just stay cool here. Uh, Alina, procedurally and for this vote and beyond, is it okay? Are we fine with? You know, taking a vote on something, even though maybe it has to be wordsmith and brought back. Uh, yeah. And yeah, then, we have done that before. And then come back and we can take another vote at the next meeting. And yes. if, you know, maybe things have shifted, maybe people's, they've had time to mull it. And, but uh, there's nothing wrong with taking a vote on, a, on an idea now, even if it's not perfect. And we can always come back later and vote, just leave it as is. Uh, or vote again. Okay, great. Thanks. Yep. It will help in our, our next stuff too. Yeah, too. Absolutely. And we have done that in the past, so I think that works. So uh, who is going to make a motion to move forward in the spirit of this recommendation? So this is uh, this is James Stoker. Just just really quickly, I want, I want to make just a quick suggestion if you go back and, and, and revise this. Not about the language, but about the, the text. I think it would be really useful if you would include the original um, the original recommendations and how they were worded just so that we can see those two side by side, so that anyone in the future who goes to implement these recommendations will understand what has stayed the same and what has changed. So having the exact text and maybe a reference number, I think each of the, um, the recommendations are numbered in some way. Um, just including all of that in the text would make it much easier for this to be implemented. Thanks very much. Makes sense. Thanks, James. So do I have a motion? Yes, this is Roger. What's the motion? Move for us to vote on this uh, recommendation. Um, not the wording itself, but the spirit of it, correct? Yes, yes correct. Okay. 
Do I have a second? Jason Gart, second. Okay, let's take a voice vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, uh, those opposed, please say nay. Okay, those who abstain, please uh, voice your abstention. This is Bobby from DOJ and I abstain. And I'm sorry, I wanted to vote aye. Martha, please mark me down as an aye. Sorry about that. So busy listening to everyone else's eyes. Okay. So, okay, we're good. I've got them all. Thank you. Great. Okay, well, thank you, Technology Subcommittee. Great work. Um, and I don't mean to move everyone along, but I do want to make sure we get in the process subcommittee before our break. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Alexis Graves and Michael Morrissey and let you guys drive from here. Hi. Well, good morning, everyone. Today, uh, we are going to have our esteemed colleague from the American Bar Association, Tom Sussman, um, present on what is our updated recommendations from our first party working group. Um, before turning it over to Tom, I do just want to thank um, on behalf of the process subcommittee and the first party uh, working group, um, all of our committee uh, members uh, for your just, you know, very thoughtful uh, comments during our December committee meeting. And we, of course, um, appreciate those comments that we received from our colleagues at the Department of Homeland Security as well. So um, without further ado, I will actually turn it over to Tom. Tom, you're muted. Tom, you're muted. Not able to hear Tom. Michelle, and yeah, we're unable able to hear Tom. He might, Tom, you might need to um, oh. dial in on the regular audio because I think your um, laptop audio or PC is, is not working again. Tom will introduce this recommendation through interpretive dance. <laughs> yeah, Tom, I'm going to recommend that you dial in via regular audio. I'll send you that information if you need it, but um, we can move on while we wait on Tom, if you like. While Tom is getting on, would someone else like to start us off? First recommendation, or do you want to wait for Tom? I'm sending Tom the information, so he should have it. Alina, I'm not sure in terms of your schedule. Uh, when did you have the break schedule? Should we, I, I, you know? 1130. So 11 we've got 30. 20 minutes. OK. Um, All right, I think Tom is okay, on the can line. You, Tom, can you hear us? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. Let, me try to Let me try to mute you here. here. All right. How do I keep the feedback from coming? Yeah, you'll need to make sure that your volume on your computer is turned down and that you are completely muted on WebEx audio as well. So make sure you turn your computer All right, how's volume that? Down. Much better. Thank okay. you. Okay, all right. As I started to say, the first FOIA request I ever made was <clears throat> from my own file from the FBI. Um, and uh, it, it, I, I learned a great deal. It was quite remarkable. Uh, uh, I hadn't realized I was such a uh, party of interest uh, through the years uh, of the Bureau when I was a law clerk and working on Capitol Hill. Um, I'm going to make a brief presentation, and because I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. Uh, obviously, uh, my our task force colleagues, Roger, Alexis, and Tuan, um, uh, were very active in uh, interviewing, and we had biweekly meetings and uh, put a lot of effort in here. Um, and so I'm going to sort of present it from a high level, and then we'll go into the specific recommendations, presuming that you have read uh, the, our memorandum. Uh, 
former Federal Advisory Committee member uh, Margaret Quoka has actually done extensive empirical research on who requesters are across the federal government. Uh, she wrote an article on uh, uh, FOIA Inc., which is business requesters. She wrote an article on first-person requests. She wrote a book um, that has a great deal of information on first-party requests. And in all of these, she identifies, you know, the media, business, and the first-person requesters uh, and deals with each separately. But her findings in this last category are, were kind of startling and I think probably one of the reasons why we focused on this issue. Uh, and that is uh, first-person requests are the single largest category of requests in the federal government. Uh, the Department of Homeland Security receives nearly half of all requests filed across the federal government and uh, most of those are first-person requests. Uh, and other agencies ranging from the Department of State, Veterans Health Administration, Justice Department, EEOC, Social Security, have a large quantity of these first-party requests. Uh, the first, uh, the prior advisory committee focused on this issue, and as our memorandum begins, made a recommendation calling for OGIS and OIP to encourage agencies, basically, uh, to identify common categories of first-party requests and um, establish more efficient approaches uh, to responding. Um, we looked at Social Security, IRS, uh, that has, uh, you know, developed portals for obtaining information, IRS transcript, uh, 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 Social Security uh, histories, uh, Medicare, et cetera. So there are uh, uh, efficient ways of doing this uh, electronically that doesn't require a FOIA request or a response. Um, I, I, I want to sort of point out, I guess, uh, not as an aside, but as an, uh, a key issue, that first-party requests should not be unwelcome by agencies. Um, it's, the, FOIA is often the only way that an individual can obtain a benefit or participate in a proceeding or even avoid expulsion from the country. Uh, and there are, you know, there are mechanisms for holding government accountable uh, as well as uh, uh, other kinds of requests. So our subcommittee developed these four recommendations uh, that uh, we'd like to discuss and vote on separately. I, I want to acknowledge that uh, DHS was extremely um, generous with their time, both in discussions, and we received just uh, yesterday uh, some very useful suggestions to this uh, report that you have, uh, and uh, hadn't, didn't have time, and frankly, didn't want to uh, burden you with having to have a replacement at the last minute, but uh, I want to thank, uh, uh, I want to thank uh, Amy Bennett and her colleagues at DHS for their efforts to provide um, us with some uh, constructive guidance as we go along. Um, I, I want to end with a, a, a sort of one of the more recent developments, and that is the Justice Department's recognition that this issue uh, is important, and uh, Attorney General Garland's March 15th memorandum, uh, which Bobby probably has read before, uh, which uh, under the heading of Removing Barriers to Access, and reducing uh, FOIA request backlogs, specifically um, says that the Justice Department's Executive Office of Immigration Review, uh, which is one of the um, agencies, sub-agencies that we looked at, has long required individuals to file FOIA requests to obtain official copies of their own records of immigration court proceedings. We are now changing that policy, and I encourage all agencies to examine whether they have similar or other categories of records that they could make more readily accessible without requiring individuals to file FOIA requests. So uh, thank you, Attorney General Garland, for uh, anticipating uh, our recommendation in that respect, um, and, um, and I think he nailed it on the head that it is going to be a more efficient and effective way of not only responding to the individual requests, um, or, or instead of responding to individual requests, but in the long run, saving time and energy of the government, uh, recognizing that uh, resources will be required to retool in these agencies with large numbers of first-party requests. Uh, we are not <clears throat> unmindful 
uh, of the fact that um, the change process requires um, uh, technology, training, um, evaluation, uh, uh, testing, et cetera. Uh, but um, I guess one of the reasons why we're replowing some of the field that had been plowed by the prior advisory committee is because not all that much has been done, and I guess we'd like to, we're going to keep recommending it <laughs> until we see some progress. So that's my general overview, and uh, if you want to go to the, uh, yeah, the recommendation one, which is on the screen, uh, and that's, a, as best as I can see, that's effectively, um, you know, last, uh, uh, the, the last recommendation we made and uh, the Attorney General's uh, recommendation uh, that, uh, no, I'm sorry, that, that I'm thinking of recommendation two uh, or three that's, that's restated. This one is... Um, um, you know that there shouldn't you shouldn't have to make a request where you know where the agency knows the person is going to need the record, um, and um, so that's you know kind of where we start. Uh, and let's open this for questions and comments. And perhaps one of the other members of the task force would, who did some in-depth research would add to uh, the commentary. or not. Questions? All right, don't be shy, anyone. I'll speak up. All right, do we, do we want to vote on it? I'll, 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 uh, I'll uh, welcome a, a motion to approve if there's not this any is discussion. James Stoker. <laughs> Sorry, this is, Jay, this is James Stoker here. I just wanted to take a minute to thank the working group for all the great work that they've done on this. It's a fantastic report. Um, as someone who helped work on the recommendation in the last uh, committee committee term, I think you guys have taken this farther. Uh, you've gone into much more detail, and you've done you know amazing research that we were not able to do. So, so thank you for that. I think all four of these recommendations are fantastic. I do have a question on recommendation number four, but we can we can get there when uh, when the time comes. So, thanks very much. Yeah. I expect there will be other questions on number four, but do do I have a motion on recommendation number one? Jason Garner. Approve recommendation number one. This is Alexandra Perlchild. Thanks, Alexandra. Uh, we have a motion. Uh, do we have a second? Jason Garner, second. second. Thank you. All right, let's take a voice vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Martha, you got that? Uh, all those opposed, please say nay. 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 Okay. Who are the names? Kristen Ellis, FBI. Alan Bloodstein and Kristen Ellis. That's okay. what I heard. Any other names? Okay. Uh, any abstentions? Uh, this is Bobby from DOJ, um, and I abstain. I will reemphasize that uh, I appreciate Tom mentioning the Attorney General's guidelines um, and it, removing access, removing barriers to access being a key focus of the department. Martha, are you good with? Yes, Martha? you're. A, you are a yay, correct, Alina? Yes, I'm an. I'm a um, I. You're an I. Sorry. <laughs> yay. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, yes, we're all good. I've got it. I've got it tracked. Thank you. So I believe the first recommendation passes. Not unanimously. Okay. Close enough, right, Tom? Do you want to go on to recommendation number two? Sure. So few things happen in Washington unanimously these days that I'm not even offended that we didn't get all the votes. Uh, recommendation number two is a, is, is a narrow one. Uh, as, as we did our research, we discovered that, for example, uh, some of the progress made in providing a portal for uh, uh, direct uh, access to information and immigration files necessary for proceedings were available to attorneys but not to individuals, but alas, um, I, I guess half or more of the cases involved pro se uh, parties uh, worried about getting um, deported, and um, they have to go through a different process, a FOIA request for their uh, uh, records. And so, uh, you know, we couldn't qualify it more than by to the extent feasible, because uh, uh, in some cases it may or may not be, but we really are trying to focus the agency's attention 
on the sub on the fact that um, uh, individuals not represented by lawyers should have access uh, appears that this is just immigration you only talk about immigration uh, in in your uh, your discussion draft so is this but you just say agency in the recommendation is this no. intended to be used for elsewhere as well because I can't think of where that would happen or is this just immigration uh, uh, well we, we you know we confess not to have done a thorough government-wide inquiry into all of the first party request situations and so while we know this is the situation with immigration uh, it could be elsewhere don't know the answer to that but why narrow it now and then someone will come up and say well wait a second uh, you know the veterans agency one of the vet or one of the uh, uh, you know uh, other benefits agency has a, a, a similar uh, uh, restriction and uh, then we say oh whoops I mean, there's no no harm, I guess, in making it general. In that case, I would recommend that rather than use this language adversely impacting, which an agency may say, well, they're not adversely impacted, you know, that you just say something like agencies should amend, you know, regulations, director policies, and guidance um, to affect to uh, ensure uh, equal uh, treatment to to, to ensure. And equal, not not equal treatment, but to ensure an equal process for both rep, both represented and unrepresented parties, or equal access process. Equal access process. Uh, that uh, let me let me hear from other members of the task force or subcommittee on that subject. But that that, that um, actually seems to me an improvement personally. This is Kristen Ellis from the FBI. Um, I, so I, I shockingly agree with Cal that it should that, that what we're talking about is equal access. Um, I, I'm a little concerned with the notion of creating a special category for pro se parties because there are a lot of pro se requesters who are very very sophisticated um, and. You know they don't need a counsel. They they are essentially professionals at this, and so I'm not sure that their ability to access records is adversely impacted any more than say the ACLU's or the Washington Post's, um, because those folks are typically represented people. So I'm I'm not sure what problem we're getting at. I mean I understand it's the pro se it's the Joe Smith off the street pro se person who's never gone through the process before. But I, I don't think as a category, pro se parties is, are necessarily universally impacted adversely by processes. This is Juan Samahan, if I can just speak up. So uh, let's talk specifically about what was done in, in front of EOR, the Executive Office for Immigration Review. They rolled out a portal, a FOIA alternative uh, called ECAS that uh, would allow attorneys on behalf of their clients to simply uh, access through ECAS, the FOIA alternative, uh, their uh, transcripts of their proceedings. Uh, if you, on the other hand, are a, uh, a non-represented person, uh, you could not avail yourself of the benefit of the FOIA alternative. So we're not saying that you couldn't file a FOIA request as a sophisticated, hypothesized uh, pro se requester. The point is that if you're going to provide FOIA alternatives, you make them available on equal terms to the uh, to the uh, individuals who can't afford an attorney. Uh, and as, as Tom mentioned, this principle is generalizable. We did not generally survey uh, the whole of the federal government looking for instances where there's differential treatment with respect to pro se versus represented parties for FOIA al or alternatives. Um, but uh, we, we do think that it's the case that their access should not be uh, sort of impaired. I, I'm getting the sense uh, that it's possible that Eeyore, in sort of responding and being in dialogue with us, may very well, very soon, change its own policies 
uh, to uh, make uh, this available uh, to uh, you know parties that are uh, you know not represented by counsel. And, and we also suspect that a lot of these individuals aren't necessarily sophisticated. I'll add in the context of uh, you know people in removal proceedings. Uh, you know these are uh, people who are uh, likely to be exactly the opposite. So. So this and is, this is um, sorry. This is Kristen again. I don't disagree okay. with that, um, but I think that that's a very specific example in the realm of a very broad FOIA community. So I mean, I think that it is valid to say that all requesters should have equal access to systems, or you know, there, there shouldn't be. We shouldn't be creating different castes of people, whether they are a pro se requester or a represented requester. Um, but I, I think that the example you gave is a very specific one that I, in, in my travels in FOIA and the federal government, have not seen uh, such differentiation being made between the types of requesters that way. Well, we, we agree. This is Juan Samahan from Bill and Law. We, we, we agree that, you know, it was, it was Eeyore who made that distinction. And introduced it, uh, you know. So I, I, I take your point. I, I don't think there should be any difference, and there certainly isn't with respect to FOIA access. Again, with respect to alternatives to FOIA access, we don't think there should be any distinction. We're just saying that uh, you know agencies need to be mindful of this because it, they have drawn something. They, by you or specifically, has drawn such a distinction, creating. A substantial burden. And this is not a negligible category, right? So most of the business at EOR is dealing with uh, persons who are, in fact, uh, pro se. So this is Bobby from DOJ, and I, I can speak to this. So um, EOR did, well, first and foremost, if, if, if we're considering this recommendation, I agree that I think a broader language that looks to, because uh, no one, I think, would disagree that uh, you want equal access with regard to any kind of alternative means or processes to get records. Um, but EOR has changed its policy. Uh, and so um, as far as any person, uh, any respondent can access directly from the courts their records and don't have to make a FOIA request anymore. Um, and so that's, that's, uh, that's been updated in their policies on their website. Um, and uh, specific to EOR, I think this recommendation has already been accomplished. This is Alexandra Perloff Giles. Um, I, I agree with Kristen that the pro se designation in FOIA generally is confusing. If I'm thinking of the journalists in the New York Times newsroom, I don't know if they're counseled or not. Most of the time, counsel doesn't get involved unless there's an issue. Um, but I, I wonder if we could rephrase this to indicate that what we're getting at is pro se in the legal proceedings to which the FOIA records pertain as opposed to pro se in the FOIA requesting process. Like that seems like a, a meaningful distinction. So whether it's immigration or any other kind of benefit to which the FOIA records pertain, that's what their pro se is for purposes of this. I don't know if that's a feasible way of getting the issue. So this is Kel, as the person who sort of raised, opened this can of worms, uh, I think that, I, I think that I would be in favor of it with the, the, the language that I, I modified, basically, that Christian and I have basically miraculously agreed on for uh, just being more of a best practice that they should make sure that they, those who do have or think of having in the future an alternative process, don't do something like set up a, a, a portal system that you have to be a lawyer to get into, which I have run into in the past, not in FOIA, but, you know, the EEOC used to have a thing that only lawyers could log in to the system to file briefs and, and read briefs, and pro se people couldn't. So it's not unheard of. Uh, but if that's the case, then passing it with that modification, the absolute worst thing that happens is it prevents someone from doing the wrong thing in two years. You know, and, and nobody needs fixing now. And the best case scenario is it fixes something somewhere that we don't know about. So I don't see any harm in passing it 
So I, I guess I'm, I'm of the belief that we should recommend things that are good, whether they have universal impact or not. So this is Tom Sussman again. Let me, uh, stepping uh, back with uh, the comments that have been made, if we deleted adversely impacting access um, and simply inserted instead, uh, well, I'll read the whole thing. To the extent feasible, agency should amend any existing regulations, directives, policy, and guidance to provide equal access to records for pro se parties. Pro se is a term of art. I would just say, since we're talking about equal, I would say equal for represented and unrepresented to make sure that you're hitting both sides of it and there's to be no that question probably, of the information. Okay, represented. So, just so I'm clear, we're saying to provide equal access to both represented and unrepresented parties. That's what we're proposing. And, I, that, and, and by putting it that way, that also suggests that that's the, proceed, the underlying proceeding and not the FOIA request that we're talking about. Right. For Alexandra's suggestion. I would vote for that. And we're going to keep the word parties, though, not requesters, right? Entities. Oh, no, so this is first party request. So say uh, persons or individuals. Individuals, Tom, is that copacetic? Uh, no. I'm okay with that. I heard someone say they're okay with that. This is Alexis Graves, USDA. I yes. would be okay with the, the uh, recommendations uh, with those modifications, uh, striking adversely impacting access or pro se and revising with the language. Um, to provide equal access to both represented and unrepresented represented. individuals. That's exactly. what we're coming with? Yes. Okay. Anyone else? Could we move to vote on that with that? Yeah, I would love that. that. This is this is Michael from Muckrock. Just because, because of that discussion, I'm wondering if it should be you know, one one last week of any existing or proposed regulations, you know, because there was a lot of discussion about sort of forward looking things. What? Jason Gart, History Associates, agreed. This is uh, Tuan Samahan from the uh, Villanova uh, and the Working Group. Uh, I agree with both Mike's suggestion just now as well as uh, Kel's. Uh... This is Kristen Ellis. Can somebody read back to me what the language will be? Well, uh, we, we might, this is Tom Sussman. We might want to, uh, I, I agree with uh, Michael about the uh, proposed regulations, but it, it just dropping in existing or proposed doesn't work because you don't amend proposed regulations. You develop proposed regulations. So I guess I'd, I'd if we have a sense that that should be part of the language, it might take a little crafting uh, to to get it finalized, uh, or maybe we can do it over the break you know, this okay, morning. So this is, how about future again, instead of proposed? So, can we just go back to? I don't disagree with Michael's recommendation, by the way, but what the language after that would like? I don't. I am not tracking on what we're proposing now. Why don't we just type it in the chat? That would work for me too. I, I, I'm just trying to figure out what we're proposing. Okay, I'm happy to type it in if someone can read it to me. This is Martha, sorry. <laughs> so the beginning is the same, Martha, to the extent feasible, agencies should amend any existing, and we're not clear about where, whether we're gonna say proposed or future, so we'll leave that alone. Regulations, directives, policies, and guidance to provide equal access to both represented and unrepresented individuals. So this is, Kel, I have a stupid question at the point at this point. 
if we're if this is a best practice anyway, why do we have it to the extent feasible? Why don't we why don't we just say agencies should amend and if it's not feasible then they don't follow the best practice? Tom? Group? Uh, I mean, I, this is Tom. I, I, you know, I'm okay with to the extent feasible and, um, you know, simply because as we admitted, we have not um, exhausted, exhaustively um, cataloged every agency and potential practices that might be, this might be applied to. And so, it, it it makes me more comfortable. All right. So just like we did um, previously with the technology subcommittee, why don't we try to move ahead and uh, and vote on the spirit and the language as we have it right now? Maybe we'll continue to to wordsmith a little bit more. Does that sound feasible, Tom? So ordered. Okay. So do I have a motion? to approve this recommendation with the language that we were proposing and perhaps some additional wordsmithing. This is Tuan Samahan, I so move. Thank you, Tuan. Do I have a second? Jason Gart, second. Grace, USDA, second. I have a third. Very exciting. Thank you. Alexis, thirds. Okay, let's take a voice vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, anyone opposed, please say nay. I don't hear any nays. Uh, any abstentions? Bobby, I'm abstaining. This is Alan. I'm going to abstain. Alan is abstaining. Alan Bloodstein abstaining and Bobby Talibian abstaining. Okay. This is Martha. Martha. I got, I've got all those. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I just want to note the time. It is 11... 40, and I want to leave it up to Tom as to whether you want to try to keep going or should we take a break? I'm, I'm prepared to I think three ought to be uh, re relatively easy. Uh, there may be more discussion. We've already had a preview that there are going to be questions on recommendation four. four. So do we want to do, do we want to try to squeeze three in and then uh, do a four right after the break? Yeah, that would be great. Let's go ahead and move on to three. Yeah. Michelle, next slide, please. And and again, this is this is the one that seems to me, uh, you know, um, uh, a, a a riff on the earlier uh, uh, advisory committee's recommendations. Quite general, asking agencies to please, you know, uh, examine your own uh, situation and develop a plan for leveraging technology that promotes efficiency uh, and customer service. Uh, so it's very broad and precatory, and we don't single any set of records or agencies out there to, it's good pra best practice for all agencies. Any questions? Dave Coolier, I move approval of recommendation three. And for time's sake, I second my own motion. I second the motion. <laughs> <laughs> I heard a second from Roger as well. Um, are we ready to take a voice vote? Does anyone have any questions about recommendation three? I'm not seeing any questions. I think everyone needs a break. Okay, so let's take a voice vote. All those in favor of recommendation number three, please say aye. 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 Uh, anyone opposed, please say nay. I don't hear any nays. Anyone up, uh, wants to abstain? I'm abstaining. That was Bobby Talibian abstaining? Yes, yeah, sorry. Bobby didn't use it. Anyone else abstaining? Okay, so I think we've passed this one as well. And it is captured. Thank you. So should we move to break, Alina? Yes. <laughs> Break time.
This meeting is being recorded. Alina, we're not hearing you. Yeah, Alina, you need to unmute yourself. It would really be helpful if I were unmuted. I said good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, uh, and welcome back from the break. Um, and I'm now going to turn things back over to Tom Sussman to uh, finish up recommendation number four um, for the first party uh, working group. Tom, over to you. So as my um, initial introduction to this issue pointed out, uh, DHS is uh, uh, the agency with the largest number of first person and first party requests. Um, uh, most of them immigration or, or exclusion or uh, you know otherwise related to uh, 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 refugee status uh, uh, and so on. Uh, and we really looked hard at that because we, we heard from a lot of the lawyers who deal with the various sub-agencies who uh, believe this is the, one of the biggest problems that they have. Uh, the agency has tried to uh, streamline process to, to speed up uh, responses, uh, but the parties tell us that uh, it's uh, not entirely uh, successful. Um, and so we really looked hard and tried to figure out what can we say and what can we do because we felt that something needs to be done. Now, I'll say that, you know, uh, DHS did a great job of uh, convincing us that, that it was unlikely that we could figure it out uh, as an advisory committee in the time available and with the expertise we have. Uh, there are um, law enforcement records. There are uh, national security records. Uh, there are records from uh, different um, uh, different uh, agencies, the State Department, uh, uh, Justice Department. Um, they paper records that uh, some statutes actually, statute may actually require paper records. Um, a diverse number of proceedings, and so... Um, not having any hair to pull out in uh, frustration, um, we talked about, okay, uh, <laughs> to whom can we pass the buck? Uh, and so the recommendation is worded to suggest that there be a outside assessment of by um, an entity, uh, organization that does have some technological capacity, uh, that is, to understand uh, as it relates to the A files, which is the the single most requested file um, that we were dealing with, um, it, because it, it it's used in all of I guess the um, uh, various kinds of proceedings, uh, 70 million files. Um, we talked about you know who could do this. It would require funding. Yes, it should it should be funded. Um, uh, we'd like to take this recommendation to Congress and say, look, uh, this is a big problem and um, you should uh, uh, have, have HHS engage a, a contract agency. You know, I, there are some out there, I guess, that are doing FOIA-related work now that have technology uh, capacity. We ran across MITRE in one of our uh, forays. Uh, there are probably others. Um, but that this really requires a in-depth, thorough, uh, probably long-term study. But the consequences are great, and I mean the the number of people engaged in just moving records around and in, in uh, DHS is is immense, and the time and the energy and uh, cost today. And so uh, there's no sign that this is diminishing. There's no sign that uh, any of the initiatives are going to change things quickly. And so. Um, uh, you can call it punting, uh, but uh, we call it being practical about our own capacity to develop uh, specifics. And therefore, the recommendation simply is that, uh, 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 you know, a, an assessment uh, should be initiated uh, as it relates to the A files. And we suggest in the discussion that that probably should be a non governmental entity with expertise in developing. Um, uh, you know, systems for uh, records. 
And that's my overview. Okay, questions, comments? I thought this was going to be a controversial topic. Uh, this is Alan Blutstein from America Rising. Uh, I, my initial question is, well, who's paying for this? Yeah. I mean, is, has DHS agreed to this? Would it be some, would it, would the money be coming out of someone else's budget? Well, we, as I think I said, uh, this is Tom Sussman, is, uh, you know, our preference would be for Congress to, you know, if, if I were the, FOIA angel, I'd say Congress should direct a study and fund it. On the other hand, uh, this is clearly costing DHS a great deal of money every year to deal with these files, and perhaps it could um, see its way to finding a, uh, an ability. We're not talking about you know, merely as much money as it takes to run the program, so um, uh, it's one of these things where the efficiencies would pay off, but of course agencies don't deal in um, out years. So uh, recognize the problem uh, suggests that there would need to be separate funding, but either the agency or congressionally authorized or appropriated. So this is Kel. I have I have a question about this. When we're talking about what they're looking into, vendor, or no, I, I, I take, uh, someone who's a specific knowledge in technology research, technology development, because my understanding of this recommendation, or at least what you're going for, what they would be coming up with, would include answers to the questions like, with what staff, you know, what you're going you, are you, we going to hire new staff to handle these new uh, requests under the A file system or, or something? Is that correct that you're talking about someone to basically come in and audit prospectively what it would look, what it would take in order to do X, Y, Z in order to set the system up? Yeah, yeah, this is Tom Sussman. Yes, I mean, we want someone to come in and audit what it would take. Now, obviously, it would require, you know, uh, the establishment probably of new systems, the training of staff. I mean, we're not, we're, I, you know, I have looked at a couple of A files, and I mean, it's pretty complicated stuff. Uh, and so, you know, the question would be, well, going forward, do they establish a system that segregates public from non-public, which is certainly possible to do. I mean, other agencies do that, uh, which, um, you know, allows automatic access uh, uh, when the proceeding begins uh, to uh, either the, either the uh, uh, immigrant pro se or counsel, uh, not just uh, uh, through lawyers. Uh, I mean, I... As I said before, I, I don't, I'm not going to have a lot of specific answers because that's one of the reasons why we recommend uh, an outside assessment. Uh, we see a problem. Uh, it needs uh, to be addressed, and uh, there are people capable of addressing it. When you say non-government, do you just mean non-executive to do this? Or maybe... Uh, CBO to the degree that they're talking about sort of how much it would cost to do the program. CBO won't 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 do the assessment, uh, and I don't know whether GAO. Um, I, 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 someone else may have an answer to whether GAO has the competence to do this kind of in-depth assessment. Maybe I don't know whether they do the t a lot of technology. Anyone else have any views? Well, they do audits of, te of technology programs all the time. But this this is a little bit beyond the scope. I, I mean, in my mention, you'd be asking them to sort of prospectively design a system that would do X, Y, Z. I think that if GAO were to do it, they would do an assessment of basically what you've done. Is this a problem? 
and then and what are alternative solutions for what are, what are the possibilities for for fixing it it wouldn't just be go forth and design a system You know, I, I, Kel Tom I, 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 we're, we're we're trying very hard not to get into the micromanagement of what it should be done. Uh, I do think that your uh, suggestion that maybe GAO could do it. Well, uh, since the recommendation simply says uh, it should be initiated, uh, it would be quite easy for us to, uh, if my colleagues who were involved in the task force and subcommittee agreed, to amend the commentary to say. Uh, 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 you know, the, the, the assessment could be would be performed by a non-government entity with expertise in research development, et cetera, uh, or uh, by the uh, governmental uh, uh, the governmental accountability office, government accountability office, uh, uh, if appropriate, or something. You know, that's pretty simple in the commentary. Well, how about just a non-executive branch entity instead of non-governmental? Uh, you know, if they if if they think that they can get what is uh, you know the, someone from uh, uh, inside the executive branch, I, I, you know, at the GSA and their you know technology division, I I don't want to I don't want to micromanage this, you know. I want to uh, take a second to welcome back James Stoker. Um, James, you had a question you wanted to raise or a comment you wanted to make about number four. So now's, now's a good time. Thanks, Linda. This is James Stoker. Well, my, my question may have already been answered. I ask, uh, what did the subcommittee mean by non-governmental entity? And I think that uh, it's been clear that uh, open the, 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 the subcommittee is open to a wide variety of different uh, different actors. So that does answer my question. Thanks. Okay, great, thank you. All right, any other questions or comments? Jason Gart, History Associates. Um, do you have a, um, Tom, do you have a, a sense of the universe of how much this assessment might cost um, when you're talking about, you know, approximately 70 million records? And might that be important because it, it kind of, I, I understand you don't want to micromanage it, but this could be a, a significant well, undertaking. Well, I mean, if they, we're talking about 70 million records in existence and increasing each year. And so uh, it seems to me that the low hanging fruit element of this is creating a system, the, in, unless we're expecting in the next century for the U.S. to cut off access to all immigration, refugees, et cetera, asylum seekers then this is going to be a continuing issue. So prospective only would be, you know, a practical way to start and not, you know, I, I, and so I, I would guess that would be a lot cheaper than trying to figure out how to digitize in an effective way for access the existing records that I understand are kept in Stone Mountain and there are, you know, tons and tons and tons of them. So no, in the end, but the short answer is no, I don't know how much it would cost. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Yeah. And Jason, this is Tuan Samahan. Our discussions focused on the pragmatics of sort of not making the uh, perfect the enemy of the good and, and about prospective changes that uh, could be helpful going forward. Uh, and uh, we were looking at some of the things that IRS, for example, has been able to do in creating tax transcripts by making databases talk to one another and creating self-service portals uh, and again the idea is that <clears throat> these a files are frequently requested but uh, again there is a mix of materials in those a files that uh, that makes the process very labor intensive and so the uh, feasibility is to figure out uh, you know if the way we're taking data in can you know ab initio sort of be segregated in certain ways that could readily provide certain information in, in certain ways going forward. You know, this would this is what this the assessment is going to be of say an outfit, whether you're talking about a MITRE or some other similar governmental contractor working with the executive branch uh, streamlining how they do this going forward. 
this would really, uh, in the long run, I think, have some substantial cost savings uh, as well as efficiencies in terms of turning around records quickly. That's uh, that was uh, the object. Um, just a follow-up question, I guess maybe this is even to Alina or anyone else. I assume that with the transition to electro electronic records, the creation of new records would have to be digital born, or is that incorrect? I can't tell you, I'm honestly sure about the answer 100%. I would say it sounds logical what you're saying. They should be uh, born digitally, um, but I'm not the records officer. Where the United States so, really wanted to defer. Alina, this is, Alina, this is Tom Sussman. Uh, when we discussed this with DHS, we were told that um, they have a requirement for keeping paper records for some historic reason. Uh, so obviously that would have to be addressed by Congress if that's if it's legislated. Yeah, thanks for the reminder, Tom. You're absolutely right. That's at least for, for DHS, yes. But does that mean, Jason Gardigan, does that mean that they should not also then meet the electronic records requirement? And again, this only this only helps you. Sure. I honestly don't know the answer, but I will note it and take it back to the folks who do know the answers to those questions. So um, I will circle back to you. This is Alexis Graves, USDA. Uh, Jason, are you referring to the um, M1921 guidance? Is that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, um, you know, obviously we've got that December 2022 deadline fast approaching. Um, the reality is, is that, you know, a lot of the work, the inventories that would have to be done with respect to records management um, couldn't be done, obviously, in the last two years while we were in a maximum telework work posture. Um, so I do know, um, and I think it's going to be a real struggle to kind of meet that. So yes, we, we are moving closer to the target and we're doing everything that we can. Um, but the reality is, I think that most are still confident saying that uh, most agencies are not going to be able at this structure to be able to meet that. Um, this is Alina Simo again. I, I don't think the answer, though, to these to these great questions, Jason, would necessarily affect the recommendation. Um, but I, I, great question. So I will. I, I've noted them, and I will bring back some answers. My and I absolutely agree that my intent was not. I'm just trying to wrap my head around um, what an assessment look, like this would look like, and then the fact that well, um, moving forward at a certain date, they should all you know by law they should all, I guess they should all be born digital in some form, which would then help, I guess, in. It, moving forward in the release, in the ease of a release, right? Um, but but agreed. This you know, I I that that's a separate conversation than than this recommendation. All right. Any other questions or comments? Are are mm -hmm. we ready to vote on number four? Uh, this is Patricia West from EPA. I I have a question. Um, I was just curious. Um, did the was the subcommittee able to speak with DHS regarding this assessment? And I was curious as to what their uh, comments were. This is Tom. Yes, the uh, Tom Sussman. The answer is yes. We did. We had a very fruitful discussion on the subject, and uh, individual members spoke separately as well. Um, we had a, a group session. Uh, and as I say, the report was uh, in draft was circulated to them, and we received back some comments. So, um, uh, but I, but I don't think it would be unfair to say that one of the reasons we persisted was that uh, DHS has a lot on its plate, um, and um, they uh, they they didn't. It, our discussions didn't suggest that they were going to be undertaking at their own initiative any major changes. 
uh, in the foreseeable future. And I'm not saying that they don't recognize a problem. I think they do recognize a problem. Jim Holzer, who's sort of the, the top guy over there, is uh, you know used to be a uh, over at OGIS. He understands uh, you know uh, uh, FOIA from the ground up, and so I just um, uh, uh, we felt that perhaps we would be helping them by making this kind of a recommendation because it's unlikely that internal FOIA staff at, H, at DHS would go to the, be able to go to the higher-ups and say, you know, we need money to do a study because we're doing things, um, we, we need to do things severely differently. And, and just to, uh, to follow up on the comment on the, uh, you know, born digital issue going forward, you know, born digital doesn't necessarily mean born digitally um, uh, in such a way that it is uh, easily uh, uh, meshed with uh, FOIA requirements, and so that's. I mean, I think that's con that's anticipated in the order, but uh, we've seen too often uh, new systems of record set up that could have, from the start, uh, been in involved different fields that would some of which would be publicly available even proactively and others not, and the agency, it's more expensive and more complicated, and the agency just didn't take the time to do it. So uh, this, this might help in that as well. Um, I'm Patricia done. Patricia Wack from EPA. Um, um, thanks for, for that um, response, and I do remember a very um, robust conversation at one of our committee meetings um, with DHS and I have to agree with you. Um, I, I myself have pulled out uh, the reports from this committee past terms and pointed to different recommendations um, in order to implement, you know, best practices at, at my agencies. So um, I think I, I can see this as being very helpful to DHS in that respect. Okay. Um, keeping an eye on the time, I, it's 12.22. I, I, we still have a lot to get through. Um, any other comments, burning questions that anyone wants to raise? Or do I have a motion on number four? This is Matt at EPA. Motion to vote on number four. Thank you, Matt. Do I have a second? Roger, I second. Second. Roger, thank you for the second. Let's take a voice vote. All those in favor of recommendation number four? Please say aye. 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 Uh, anyone opposed to it, please say nay. Are there any nays? Uh, anyone abstaining? I'm from DOJ abstaining. I'm also going to abstain. Martha, did you get all of that? Yes, ma'am. Everything is, it is tracked. Thank you. Okay. All right. So I believe this concludes the process subcommittee's presentation for today. Tom, thank you very much. Thanks again to the working group. You guys did a fabulous job. I'm gonna keep things moving and turn it over to the legislation subcommittee. Uh, Patricia Webb and Cal McClanahan are the co-chairs. Uh, Patricia and Cal, I'm turning it over to you and you guys can drive from here. Oh, well, I immediately, Patricia Webb, EPA, immediately wanna pass this over to uh, Dave Coulier who is head of the uh, Reimagining OGIS Working Group. He has a potpourri of, of recommendations to discuss. Thank you, Patricia. Um, thanks for that. I'm Dave Coulier, an associate professor at the University of Arizona School of Journalism and board president of the National Freedom of Information Coalition. Uh, the previous committee term recommended that Congress, quote, strengthen the Office of Government Information Services with clear authority and expanded resources. That was uh, the recommendation. So we decided in this term, our working group would flesh that out a little bit more with more specifics. So thanks to members Tom Sussman, Patricia Weth, and A.J. Wagner for work on this. We gleaned dozens of previous writings and research listed and annotated in Appendix D of this report. I hope everyone's had a chance to look through. Um, and we've consulted with dozens of experts, including requesters and agencies, 
uh, and directors of FOIA oversight models uh, in Connecticut, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and from some of the more than 80 nations that have alternative dispute resolution agencies, enforcement uh, agencies, as it were. Uh, the list of those 40-some people are listed in Appendix A of this report, if you want to take a gander. Now, you can see in the report the seven recommendations to Congress and Archivist approved by the Legislation Subcommittee last month. I want to thank everyone who contributed to these ideas, which led to basically 15 iterations of this report as we continued to gather information and revise. Some of us wanted additional recommendations. Some wanted fewer. And many questions still need to be answered. In the end, I think we have some solid proposals for Congress and the Archivist to consider. Really, I think it's a great starting point to get this discussion going. And it's not going to end today. Uh, we want to say that these recommendations are not an indictment of the people at OGIS. Uh, they've done a good job of the resources that have been provided. Also, it's not a criticism of the archivist, Congress, of course, or the federal government overall. Rather, I think the takeaway is that we acknowledge the system doesn't work as well as it should, as well as it could be for requesters and agencies. We all know that. And we can learn from what others have tried, quite successfully, I might add, to save agencies and requesters time and money. And perhaps these recommendations could save taxpayers money by avoiding needless litigation. So as we go through the, each recommendation, I'll take copious notes. Uh, I'll update the report as needed. I've already received suggestions, corrections, things like that. So I'm, we're on to version, I think, 16 now. Uh, and I'd like to mirror Tom Sussman's earlier comments on the A files. We, we don't have every single detail nailed down. And I don't think we're going to get it all nailed down today, uh, or even May or June. No doubt there will be many insights and questions that need to be addressed. That's why one of the recommendations is that the specific details be researched and fleshed out in a study. See page 16 of the report for just some of the topics the need for their investigation, and we could certainly add more to the list. Uh, no doubt, I suspect each recommendation will be approved unanimously today and quickly, uh, but there is a chance maybe we'll have to continue into May and I'd certainly uh, provide an updated report with the wordsmithing if that happens. Uh, so with that, let's get started with number one. And uh, we wrote these, again, very succinct. The ideas, the committee, we just want to get there. So number one, Congress gives OGIS the authority to make binding decisions. Uh, this is probably the most important recommendation of them all. Uh, it's something we looked at really closely in these other jurisdictions. And uh, we think overall whether, uh, it, you know, how it's done and the details, uh, we'll have to figure that out. So. Uh, Open it up to questions, discussion on this first recommendation. This is Kristen Ellis from the FBI. At what point in the process do you anticipate OGIS would be getting involved to make a binding decision? Is this request going through initial processing at the agency and then an appeal at the appellate authority and then to OGIS? At which point time then somebody could go to court? That's a great quest, uh, question, Kristen, and some of that's discussed in the report, but, uh, you know, there are different ways of approaching it. I think that has to be figured out. We don't have the definitive answer. You know, we looked at Pennsylvania, where a requester uh, gets a denial. They're not happy with that. Uh, they could, you know, there's, there's situations where they could choose. They could file suit immediately, uh, just like some organizations do today, right, after day 20. Uh, maybe uh, maybe we would want them to first do an administrative appeal and have that worked out with the agency before they would go to another um, uh, situation. Uh, you know, all of that uh, we don't have defined, but certainly needs to be worked out in conjunction with, you know, uh, talking to more of the agencies, I think, uh, to include in that. So I hope Hope that doesn't really answer your question, other than there are different approaches to that. And as a follow up, when you say binding decision, OGIS looks at a request, determines that the agency, for example, improperly withheld information. 
does the agency have the ability to appeal that decision anywhere? Yes, absolutely. And that, that's clearly outlined in the report. I think we see that everywhere that there is, you know, courts are still the, the, the right place uh, for the last resort. So if an agency feels that the decision is not good, they could certainly go to the courts to challenge it. And that's how it works in Connecticut, Pennsylvania, elsewhere, uh, everywhere, really, uh, for the most part. So absolutely, as it turns out, only 3% of decisions in those cases in those states are challenged in court. So something seems to be working well there. They're, they seem to be making decisions that uh, most people uh, tend to agree with. But uh, certainly, Kristen, and that's a great question. Follow up to my follow up, and then I will let other people have opportunities. So, would it be the agency suing OGIS over the decision, or would it be the agency suing the requester? Boy, you're just nailing the questions that are so important and need to be answered. And once we worked through uh, for months on uh, that, again, is a uh, question to be just figured out. Uh, certainly, we don't want to set up a system where agencies turn around and sue the requester, and the requester all of a sudden has to hire an attorney to defend him or, self or herself in court. I mean, that that's not a good process at all, it's, and it would chill requesters, certainly. So we don't want that. Uh, and then what, do they sue OGIS? Uh, do they, you know, oh, just doesn't want that. Uh, so we have to figure that out and we have to look more closely at how that's playing out in the states and all the other nations that, that do this. But uh, I think from what I hear, that's a nut that can be cracked, that, uh, that uh, we could come up with something to make that work. Good questions. I, I think you hit, I think you hit the biggies. Uh, maybe we, We've settled, we've dispensed with those, and we can just approve everything now. Hi, this is Matt Schwartz with EPA. More questions. Oh. Hi, Matt. Hi, how are you? Um, David, uh, first of all, thanks so much for all the research that's gone into this. I mean, it's just a monumental amount of work that's been done. Um, I, and thanks to Kristen for her question. She took care of most of my comments. Uh, so thanks for that. <laughs> um, but I did have you know, some concerns with this first recommendation. I mean, I do think that OGIS would have to exponentially expand in order to handle handle this across the government. I think, honestly, it would delay decisions for requesters as well, because just, um, you know, the in, there's the increased burden on agencies having to coordinate with OGIS, the FOIA folks that would cut into their time handling other requests. And then, you know, I don't know how OGIS would handle this within the 20-day time frame. So does that mean you would have to amend the FOIA and expand the 20-day time frame? So I think there are a lot of questions here that could possibly be flushed out with recommendation six. Um, so I'd be interested to see what those studies come back with before voting on this, to be honest. Thank you, Matt. I totally agree with you. That's why that number six there. By the way, that was added most recently with a suggestion from an agency. So uh, thanks. That agency input was important. This is James, this is James Stoker. I, I had a, a couple of comments. Um, first, just um, on this notion that OGIS will need to be expanded. A absolutely. Um, it would actually be dangerous to assign some of these capabilities to, uh, to OGIS without expanding it greatly. I do think we have to keep in mind the fact that um, some of this stuff is already being done. So for instance, um, when cases are taken to court, we are actually bringing other people into the situation and incurring costs as well. So there is already massive amounts of funds being spent on um, reviewing these, these, uh, you know, th th these cases anyways, right? And Transferring some of that to OGIS may actually make it a little bit cheaper because we're not, uh, it, it might be, for instance, uh, possible for some employees who are not lawyers to do that, right, or not outside counsel, right? So the, the, the money is being spent reviewing these decisions no matter what. So I, I'm not convinced that expanding OGIS would be, would be wasteful in any ways. I also wanted to note that I was happy to see in the written report a reference to international examples to the OAS's um, model law on access to public information uh, 
for instance. I think there are other international examples that could be useful as well. Switzerland, for instance, has an arbitration procedure which is which is very very interesting. Uh, we looked at it a little bit last year in the time volume. Uh, sorry, excuse me, last term uh, in the time volume subcommittee. Um, so, in conducting these reports, it might be good not only to look at or if there's a feasibility study conducted, it might be good not only to look at uh, what is happening on a state level, but what's happening internationally as well. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you, James. You're spot on. Uh, to your first comment, I think you nailed really the the beauty of this idea. I mean, the core concept here is right now the only recourse really to requesters is to file suit in courts. And so we've seen backlogs increasing in litigation. Uh, we see a lot of requesters just walk away because they can't afford an attorney. So, and it's an expensive process. And we talk to people in the District, uh, the district of Columbia a circuit, and they said, wow, most of our cases really don't need to be here. They could be handled quicker, uh, cheaper with, they don't need a judge, federal judge, to, to take care of it. And that's what they found in Ohio when they set up a system. So they're diverting the quick hit disputes uh, away from the courts and getting them settled quickly. In Pennsylvania, most of the, the disputes are settled within 30 days. So, uh, and quickly, with um, cheaper appeals officers who are skilled in public records law, uh, but they're a lot cheaper than a, a judge and, and our court system. So really that's what this system is about. It's faster turnaround, getting rid of a, a, a lot of that stuff, and it's cheaper for the taxpayer, payer, cheaper for the agencies. Federal agencies spend 43 million a year defending themselves in court. Uh, you know, that that we shouldn't be relying on that as the sole remedy other than mediation that's still allowed now. Anyway, I just wanted to mention some of that because I think you really hit on why this is important. This is Kel. One of the things that I can sort of bring to this discussion is, and someone mentioned it in the chat, but I can sort of expound on that. A while back, the DC circuit had a mandatory mediation policy. It was a pilot program and they said that for all FOIA cases and all employment cases, but we won't talk about that. For all FOIA cases that got appealed to the circuit, you had to go to mediation. And you had to have at least one meeting. And it was a good idea in theory that did not at all account for the fact that there was literally no incentive for the DOJ attorney or the agency to do anything because they'd already won the case. And so my personal experience, my experience of other of other lawyers and pro se people who went through this were that the mediations were basically waste, a waste of time because the agency would go into the, they'd send the DOJ lawyer to the meeting and then they would sit there and they would ask sort of, how will you compromise? And the lawyer would say, we won't. And then that would be the end of the mediation. And it got so bad that at one point, an agency withdrew from mediation rather than answer the mediator's questions. And so they were able to do this because there was no cost to it. There was no ability to do anything to force them to stay in the mediation or to have a binding decision. And so if you want there to be an ADR, an Alternative Dispute Resolution Forum for FOIA at OGIS, ADR to function really needs both mediation and arbitration. And if you only have one, then it really doesn't accomplish that much except for the very low hanging fruit. Thank you, Cal. All right, uh, any other Questions, comments, uh, we have seven recommendations. Uh, it'd be, uh, I certainly want to hear folks. I'm taking notes, uh, but um, other thoughts. Jason Gardner, Jason Gardner yes. sir. Yeah, and David, we spoke about this um, yesterday. I, I, well, first of all, the group, this is, uh, I agree with everybody else that this is just very well, very, very thoughtful and very well laid out. Um, I, I differ with Cal. I, I think that the example is really the Armed Services Board of Contract Appeals 
that's been around for 50 years. It's an ADR forum. It issues binding and non-binding um, um, decisions. It's neutral, it's independent, and, and it's the place that defense contractors and the government that get into conflict come to mediate. And they have accelerated processing for small claims. You don't have to represent yourself. You don't need an attorney. You can go there. Um, and, and I really, I think that that's what's lacking and it takes a huge amount of things off of, out of the legal system and, and gets it cleared prior, prior to that. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's something that that's been very successful in the federal government. It's, um, it's something that, you know, you can be tweaked and, and, um, used as a model for this. Um, so again, just excellent work, David and, and your colleagues. Well, thanks, Jason. And and based on your comment, I added to page 16 a bullet point that part of the study needs to investigate other potential models to all like within the federal government existing. So the copyright small claims court that's been created, the, there's a variety of these things that are already out there. And maybe that would be better, uh, maybe um, making OGIS like one of those or creating a whole new agency, a whole new entity, you know. Uh, again, I, I don't think these recommendations as worded, like buying Congress to do exactly as worded. Maybe a study would say, well, that was great, but maybe we need to do create this other thing instead. That seems to make more sense. But the main point of recommendation was to create some entity that has binding authority uh, that, that diverts stuff out of the from the courts. And and it could be what you brought up. Thanks, Jason. Any other thoughts? Davis is Allison from Commerce. So would this uh, mediation, would it be a required step? Is it something that the requester could opt into if they want? How do you foresee that? Well, the way it's, the reports frame now is OGIS would have kind of two divisions. One would be mediation. Uh, and the other would be adjudication. Uh, and, and that's kind of how a lot of these other uh, folks set it up. So maybe someone wants just to go to mediation, and, and that's fine. Um, and it gets settled that way. Uh, in, in Ohio, it starts that way. Uh, but if that doesn't resolve it, and sometimes that happens, a lot of times that happens, so, uh, then you know, OGIS would have the ability to uh, go straight to adjudication, or perhaps the requester would want to request uh, straight to adjudication. So again, that's one of those details that probably needs to be uh, fleshed out a little bit more, and there are different systems to, to set that up. But that's a good question, you know, how those those could work, either or. Uh, there, there's some agencies where you have to pick as a requester. You have to pick mediation, or you have to pick adjudication, or you have to pick litigation. Uh, most of them kind of are a little more fluid. So uh, we'd have to look at those closely. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, any other questions before perhaps a motion on number one to get a sense of the, the mood of the room? Any motion? So moved, Jason Gart. Thank you, Jason. Second? Kel, okay, Kel, thanks for the second. All right, I don't know, Alina, am I usurping your yeah, power? Yeah, that's okay. Um, we'll go ahead and have take a voice vote on number one. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, all those opposed, please say nay. 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 Okay, we're going to have to break that down. I heard Kristen Ellis say nay. Allison, did you say nay? Nay. Allison Dietrich said nay. Did I hear another nay? And Matt Schwartz, EPA. I'm sorry? Matt Schwartz, EPA. Uh, Matt Schwartz, uh, EPA was a nay. Okay. Patricia? I, I was a yay. Okay, yay. Okay, just wanted to check. Um, okay, uh, Martha, did you get all of that? And I'm now going to ask anyone abstaining. 
Oh, I'm sorry, Alan, please go ahead. I'm abstaining. You're abstaining, Alan is abstaining. Uh, Bobby, I'm assuming you're abstaining. I am uh, abstaining. Okay, Alina is also abstaining. All right, Martha, how does that pass? How many votes do we have for uh, for I? I'm counting them right now. Twelve yeses. All right, three so uh, three noes, some abstains, and some absences. Okay, so that's not. Uh, does that give us a general majority? Yes, because we have uh, twenty. Well, we have 18 19 people, present. people that are present and 12. 18. 18 people are present. Correct. 12 out of 18. Okay, so I believe this recommendation passes, Dave. Okay, thanks. All right, so move on. move on to number two. Um, I, I guess they're numbered all one, but uh, so that means they are all approved. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, Just on this slide. Um, I apologize. Okay. Uh, no, 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 I'm joking. I, it's all cool. It was so, a point problem. <laughs> <laughs> so number two, Congress gives OGC authority to review records in camera. So this actually came up in 2018 in proposed legislation, but it didn't get through Congress. And what we see around the world and in the states is this is really an important uh, authority that should be given in regardless of binding decisions or mediation. Now, not everybody agrees with this. I think there are some folks in, uh, who believe that mediation requires uh, uh, some pure neutrality or some way, and I think there's a lot of folks who talk about that. But, but we think that if there's a dispute where uh, OGIS feels it really needs to look at the records to make a good decision, and particularly if we're talking binding decisions, then they really need to be able to see the records. So, uh, and, uh, you know, there are several people in OGIS who have security clearance. Uh, that's how it worked in Canada. Uh, and so that's why we're recommending no number two. Thoughts, questions? Uh, by the way, I suspect we'll have some concerns from the national security community on this. Although I haven't talked to them directly. This is Kel. I can say in support of this that the idea that mediators have to be pure, innocent souls is laughable. You know, this is what happens all the time when you have a mediation or let's say you go to a magistrate judge, which is if we're doing the binding decisions, we're sort of following the magistrate judge uh, model. Then I've been to many mediations with magistrate judges who were not issuing binding decisions, who were just serving as a, a settlement conference, who would go one or the other, you know, they go to the, to the satellite diplomacy back and forth between the parties and the judge would come to me and say, you're completely wrong here. Like, you, this, this will not, if you try to push this in court, you will lose. This is not a winning argument and so you should not, you know, in my opinion, stake your entire settlement on getting it because if they back off, you'll lose. And they'll do the same thing to the other side. So, Mediators need to be able to tell an agency or a requester that you're being dumb. You know, this is not something that you're right about. This is a very weak argument or this is a very strong argument, which they can't do unless they see the records. Thank you, Kel. This is Dave. And, and, and a bunch of experts I talked to on this, uh, a lot of the folks cited in the sources, they kind of agree with what you're saying. Cal. I'm sorry, go ahead. I interrupted you. This is Kristen from the FBI and at the risk of overstating my um, scope of representation here as a member of the intelligence community, I can confirm, Dave, that um, in fact, the national security groups will have concerns about OGIS having access to in-camera review classified, including very highly classified records. Um, also, just from a law enforcement standpoint, uh, with law enforcement records, it, that, you know, that creates additional risk as well in our ability to do our jobs. Um, so, mm -hmm. I, 
I, I think that this is going to be a problem for folks that work in this area. I see your point. Other thoughts, questions on that? Yeah, I have a, a follow up to that. This is Matt at EPA. Um, would, would it be possible to reword this to give OGC authority to review records in camera that are in dispute, for example, under exemptions five, all privileges under exemption five, but not law enforcement records under seven or national security records under one? Have we considered that? We, we actually didn't talk about that, but, um, you know, maybe that's something that, that um, uh, what do the other working group members think on that? Uh, it's, it's a might be some compromise. Yeah. Uh, uh, thoughts? Anybody have thoughts on that? Um, hi, Dave. It's Patricia West from EPA. Um, I like Matt's suggestion a lot. Um, I'm wondering... Um, Matt, do you mind saying that again? I was taking notes. Sure. I thought, you know, if there, if, if there are concerns from the intelligence community and from the law enforcement community, perhaps OGIS could, we could sort of partition out that OGIS has authority to review records that are withheld under specific exemptions, like exemption three, certain statutes, certainly exemption five, exemption six. I mean, personally, my feeling is no. I, I think if anyone needs uh, oversight the most in our country, it's the intelligence community. Uh, no offense to my comrades here. And it's even more important that someone has the ability to take a look and make sure that they're, you know, doing the right thing. Uh, but I'm just one vote. And I'm open to other thoughts and or amendments to this recommendation. Um, this is Patricia West from EPA again. Matt, um, there was a portion in your suggested language where you said, um, I think you said excluding um, records, um, law enforcement and intelligence records. Was that? Am I capturing yeah. it correctly? Yeah, that's right. So basically, exemption one, exemption seven, um, you know, if, if there has to be a compromise, maybe we can do it on the basis of actual exemptions under which agencies are holding records. I definitely understand David's concern, which I agree with. Um, but I'm just wondering if this is a fair compromise. This, this is, is so the the so reason good. that I would <laughs> besides the obvious that this is sort of my bread and butter. The reason I would push back against this is is that uh, giving OGIS this authority, especially if you have like the binding decision ability or even mediation, uh, would actually encourage people to go to OGIS over court because right now. Uh, there is, while, while judges have the right to uh, in-camera review of any documents, they don't exercise it very often. And in, in fact, if you even ask for in-camera review, the DOJ lawyer will throw 10 pages of briefs at you about why in-camera review is such a waste of time because, oh my God, we could not possibly do in-camera review because look at this declaration. And so if a requester if dealing with, and it's even worse in sort of national security case and law enforcement case, if a requester says, okay, I can go to court and fight against a declaration where the words have been expressly chosen to defeat me, or I can go to OGIS where they will more likely than not look at the actual record, well, I'll go to OGIS first. Because then if OGIS tells me, yeah, you're not going to win this fight, then maybe I don't get to court. Mm -hmm. And as to forgetting out from which is uh, bad actors, which is, which is good actors, I don't want to say that the intelligence community needs more oversight than anybody else, sort of like David said, but I will say that the cases where the information disparity in court is the greatest is B1, B7. And 
that is where it is the the agencies are given a tremendous amount of deference by the court and something like OGIS if needed because absent OGIS you're sort of at the whim of a judge who feels like going against the DOJ law. Okay, I'm going to have to step in. Thanks, Cal, for that comment. I really appreciate it. Dave, I'm going to have to step in because I've polled folks and I've gotten some feedback. Some folks have a hard stop at 1 p.m. today. I have a few folks who told me they can stay a little bit over, um, but we're definitely going to have to pick this up again in May. That's why I'm very glad we had this meeting today in April because I had a feeling we're going to still have to carry some things over to May. So we will pick up again with uh, all of these proposals in May, if, uh, if that's okay with everyone. Cal also wants to present something he will present in May. Um, but I want to be able to get in some public comments um, because I think that's important and we usually reserve that right at the end. For those of you who can stay for a little past one o'clock to hear public comments, I would appreciate that. So with that, uh, Michelle, please go ahead and give the instructions for anyone who wants to call in. Absolutely. So, ladies and gentlemen, as we move to the public comments um, session, um, please limit your comments to three minutes. Once your three minutes expires, we will mute your line and move on to the next comment. So, once again, if you could limit your um, comments to three minutes, that would be great. Thank you. Okay, while we're waiting for people to queue up on the telephone line, I'm going to ask Jesse Hartman from OGIS. I understand there are a couple of comments or questions that should be read out loud. Jesse, over to you. Hi, yes. Uh, we have three uh, comments for the committee to consider. Um, one, please consider including a placeholder for next year's committee to review whether OGIS and or DOJ OIP should be able to make referrals to the Office of Special Counsel to deter egregious behavior. Uh, number two priority is adequate funding and authority for DOJ OIP in their compliance oversight mission. Uh, Bobby is drowning, Bobby Talabian is drowning. Please consider including a recommendation to study OIP funding and authority. Uh, and the third we have is will the committee consider a uh, recommendation requiring agencies to amend past reports and raw data with narrative as to how error or false reporting has occurred. And that's all that we have in the comments so far. Okay, thanks, Jesse. Um, anyone on the committee want uh, to offer any responses to those or not? You don't have to. I can quickly, this is Bob, I'm just saying, quickly address the last comment. Um, we take very seriously the accuracy of the reports, and um, often from year to year, we do see, you know, as uh, you compare one year's report to another, some data discrepancy, and we make sure agencies footnote and explain those where we think it's most appropriate. Okay, thank you. Uh, Michelle, do we have anyone on the telephone? Um, let's see. I do not see anybody in the regular audio queue. I think that someone was trying to um, get in on the uh, WebEx audio. If you are joined um, via WebEx audio, ladies and gentlemen, be sure to click on the raise hand icon that's above your chat box. Um, that will enter you into the queue. I do see, I believe... Robert Hammond wanted to make a comment, so let's see how Robert is joined. Oh, I see he is on the regular audio. All right. Robert, your line is unmuted. You can go ahead. Uh -huh. Hi, <clears throat> this is Bob Hammond. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Hello? Yes, we can hear you, Mr. Hammond. Hey, listen, listen, Bobby, the question I'm asking uh, you, you've got my uh, presentation, DOD, massive false reporting, you know, my correspondence to the Secretary of Defense, all that kind of stuff. They, DOD has still not submitted uh, its raw data for 2016, 2017. The DHA data has no um, uh, case numbers to it. And every single year, probably because I complain, 
Uh, they correct their past reports and put a footnote in and say the following agencies corrected these portions of the report. I think last year there were like seven areas where DOD did that. What I'm saying is this nonsense will go on forever. What I'm asking is they amend a, a, the prior report whenever they say that, include the raw data that goes with that, otherwise some requests will never get uh, reported at all, and explain what the problem was. Don't do it as a footnote, amend the report, post them both. Uh, I didn't mean to get energized about that, but uh, one of the few safeguards for requesters is uh, the reports. I saw the recommendation to, produ to produce the contemporaneous logs. I like that. Uh, but that's what I'm asking for, Bobby. Um, listen, so I complain a lot. Uh, I put a lot of good comments about Defense Logistics Agency. I think they are one of the premier agencies in the world when it comes to uh, artificial intelligence, records management, the whole works. Those are in the chat line uh, on YouTube. I hope they will agree to join uh, your committee next year. They put RM and uh, FOIA under their information operations uh, area, and they use information as a warfighter enable. So they're really good at it, and, and I hope that they will consider uh, investing the time, and they have got an absolutely awesome uh, staff. Um, I put some comments into the chat uh, on YouTube and also in this uh, committee. There's a lot of discussion about being able to compel the release of records and things like that, and again, the FOIA logs. Uh, in May uh, 27th and September 2015, 2014, appeals of a B-5 denial of my April 1st, 2014 FOIA request to Navy View Med seeking Walter Reed's FY 2013 annual FOIA report, raw data and forwarding correspondence, I say this FOIA request and my appeal have been have bearing on the accuracy of FOIA reporting in the annual FOIA reports to the United States Congress and potentially the integrity of uh, FOIA request processes. After eight years and six years of litigation, I still do not have those, raw, those reports and the raw data to share with you regarding whether Walter Reed, Navy, DOD were cooking the books. What I have is a materially altered 16-page Walter Reed FOIA processing log that does not comport with the 17-page log cited in DOD's Vaughn Index, which Walter Reed admits to altering during litigation. Okay. Copies of law Mr. Mr. Relevant. Hammonds, your time has expired, sir. Okay. Anyway, there are a lot of great people in DOD, and uh, and I hope that uh, that they step forward. Uh, DOD is awesome. They just need to step forward. Thank you. All right, Mr. Hammond. Thank you. And I I know you've submitted written comments. Uh, again, I've asked the committee members to take a look at those, and they're also posted on our website. So thank you again. Uh, do we have any other callers in the queue, Michelle? I'll do a quick double check. I don't see anybody in the WebEx audio queue, um, nor do I see anyone in the uh, regular audio queue, Alina. All right. And then, Jesse, do we have any other questions or comments, either on YouTube or on the WebEx side? Nope. That is everything. Okay. Sorry to rush through all of this. I'm just very cognizant of folks' hard stop times. I want to thank all the committee members for all their hard work. Uh, thanks to Martha for being a great alternate DFO today, and thanks for the OGIS staff who's been supporting us today. We will see each other again virtually at our next meeting Thursday, May 5th at 10 a.m. Eastern Time. Um, does anyone have any questions or concerns before we stand adjourned? Not hearing anything. Um, thanks again, everyone. Stay healthy and well and safe, and we will see each other again on May 5th. Uh,